Section seven of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Slipperfox recording is in the public domain. Section seven, The Adventure of the Bruce Partington Plans, Part two. Mr. Sidney Johnson, the senior clerk, met us at the office and received us with that respect which my companion's card always commanded. He was a thin, gruff, bespectacled man of middle age his cheeks haggard, and his hands twitching from the nervous strain to which he had been subjected. "'It is bad, Mr. Holmes, very bad. Have you heard of the death of the chief?' "'We have just come from his house.' "'The place is disorganised. The chief dead, Cadigan West dead, our papers stolen. And yet, when we closed our door on Monday evening, we were as efficient an office as any in the government service. Good God, it's dreadful to think of! that West, of all men, should have done such a thing. You are sure of his guilt, then? I can see no other way out of it, and yet I would have trusted him as I trust myself. At what hour was the office closed on Monday? At five. Did you close it? I am always the last man out. Where were the plans? In that safe. I put them there myself. Is there no watchman to the building? There is, but he has other departments to look after as well. He is an old soldier and a most trustworthy man. He saw nothing that evening. Of course the fog was very thick. Suppose that Cadogan West wished to make his way into the building after hours. He would need three keys, would he not, before he could reach the papers? Yes, he would. The key of the outer door, the key of the office, and the key of the safe. Only Sir James Walter and you had those keys? I had no keys of the doors, only the safe. Was Sir James a man who was orderly in his habits? Yes, I think he was. I know that, so far as those three keys are concerned, he kept them on the same ring. I have often seen them there. And that ring went with him to London? He said so. And your key never left your possession? Never. Then West, if he is the culprit, must have had a duplicate, and yet none was found upon his body. One other point. If a clerk in this office desired to sell the plans, would it not be simpler to copy the plans for himself than to take the originals, as was actually done? It would take considerable technical knowledge to copy the plans in an effective way. But I suppose that either Sir James or you or West has that technical knowledge? No doubt we had. But I beg you wouldn't try to drag me into the matter, Mr. Holmes. What is the use of our speculating in this way when the original plans were actually found on West? Well, it is certainly singular that he should run the risk of taking originals if he could safely have taken copies, which would equally have served his turn. Singular, no doubt. And yet he did so. Every inquiry in this case reveals something inexplicable. Now, there are three papers still missing. They are, as I understand, the vital ones. Yes, that is so. Do you mean to say that anyone holding these three papers, and without the seven others, could construct a Bruce Partington submarine? I report to that effect to the Admiralty. But today... I have been over the drawings again, and I am not so sure of it. The double valves with the automatic self-adjusting slots are drawn in one of the papers, which have been returned. Until the foreigners had invented that for themselves, they could not make the boat. Of course, they might soon get over the difficulty. But the three missing drawings are the most important. Undoubtedly. I think, with your permission, I will now take a stroll around the premises. I do not recall any other question which I desired to ask." He examined the lock of the safe, the door of the room, and finally the iron shutters of the window. It was only when we were on the lawn outside that his interest was strongly excited. There was a laurel bush outside the window, and several of the branches bore signs of having been twisted or snapped. He examined them carefully with his lens, and then some dim and vague marks upon the earth beneath. Finally, he asked the chief clerk to close the iron shutters, and he pointed out to me that they hardly met in the centre, 
and that it would be possible for any one outside to see what was going on within the room. The indications are ruined by three days' delay. They may mean something or nothing. Well, Watson, I do not think that Woolwich can help us further. It is a small crop which we have gathered. Let us see if we can do better in London. Yet we added one more sheaf to our harvest before we left Woolwich Station. The clerk in the ticket office was able to say with confidence that he saw Cadogan West, whom he knew well by sight, upon the Monday night, and that he went to London by the 8.15 to London Bridge. He was alone and took a single third-class ticket. The clerk was struck at the time by his excited and nervous manner. So shaky was he that he could hardly pick up his change, and the clerk had helped him with it. A reference to the timetable showed that the 8.15 was the first train which it was possible for West to take, after he had left the lady about 7.30. "'Let us reconstruct, Watson,' said Holmes, after half an hour of silence. I am not aware that in all our joint researches we have ever had a case which was more difficult to get at. Every fresh advance which we make only reveals a fresh ridge beyond. And yet we have surely made some appreciable progress. The effect of our inquiries at Woolwich has in the main been against young Cadogan West, but the indications at the window would lead themselves to a more favourable hypothesis. Let us suppose, for example, that he had been approached by some foreign agent. It might have been done under such pledges as would have prevented him from speaking of it, and yet would have affected his thoughts in the direction indicated by his remarks to his fiancée. Very good. We will now suppose that as he went to the theatre with the young lady he suddenly, in the fog, caught a glimpse of this same agent going in the direction of the office. He was an impetuous man, quick in his decisions. Everything gave way to his duty. He followed the man, reached the window, saw the abstraction of the documents, and pursued the thief. In this way we get over the objection that no one would take originals when he could make copies. This outsider had to take originals. So far it holds together. What is the next step? Then we come into difficulties. One would imagine that under such circumstances the first act of young Cadogan West would be to seize the villain and raise the alarm. Why did he not do so? Could it have been an official superior who took the papers? That would explain West's conduct. Or could the chief have given West the slip in the fog, and West started at once to London to head him off from his own rooms, presuming that he knew where the rooms were? The call must have been very pressing, since he left his girl standing in the fog, and made no effort to communicate with her. Our scent runs cold here, and there is a vast gap between either hypothesis and the laying of West's body with the seven papers in his pocket on the roof of a metropolitan train. My instinct now is to work from the other end. If Mycroft has given us the list of addresses, we may be able to pick our man and follow two tracks instead of one. Surely enough, a note awaited us at Baker Street. A government messenger had brought it post-haste. Holmes glanced at it and threw it over to me. There are numerous small fry, but few who would handle so great an affair. The only men worth considering are Adolf Mayer, of 13 Great George Street, Westminster, Louis Le Rothier, of Camden Mansions, Notting Hill, and Hugo Oberstein, 13 Caulfield Gardens, Kensington. The latter was known to be in town on Monday, and is now reported as having left. Glad to hear you have seen some light. The Cabinet awaits your final report with the utmost anxiety. Urgent representations have arrived from the very highest quarter. The whole force of the state is at your back if you should need it. Mycroft. I'm afraid, said Holmes, smiling, that all the Queen's horses and all the Queen's men cannot avail in this matter. He had spread out his big map of London and leaned eagerly over it. Well, well, said he presently, with an exclamation of satisfaction. Things are turning a little in our direction at last. Why, Watson, I do honestly believe that we are going to pull it off after all. He slapped me on the shoulder with a sudden burst of hilarity. I am going out now. It is only a reconnaissance. I will do nothing serious without my trusted comrade and biographer at my elbow. Do you stay here, and the odds are that you will see me again in an hour or two. If time hangs heavy, get full scap and a pen, and begin your narrative of how we saved the state. I felt some reflection of his elation in my own mind, for I knew well that he would not depart so far from his usual austerity of demeanour unless there was good cause for exultation. 
All the long November evening I waited, filled with impatience for his return. At last, shortly after nine o'clock, there arrived a messenger with a note. "'Am dining at Goldini's restaurant, Gloucester Road, Kensington. Please come at once and join me there. Bring with you a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel, and a revolver. S. H.' It was a nice equipment for a respectable citizen to carry through the dim, fog-draped streets. I stowed them all discreetly away in my overcoat, and drove straight to the address given. There sat my friend, at a little round table, near the door of the garish Italian restaurant. "'Have you had something to eat? Then join me in a coffee and a curacao. Try one of the proprietor's cigars. They are less poisonous than one would expect. Have you the tools?' "'They are here, in my overcoat.' "'Excellent. Let me give you a short sketch of what I have done, with some indication of what we are about to do. Now, it must be evident to you, Watson, that this young man's body was placed on the roof of the train. That was clear from the instant that I determined the fact that it was from the roof, and not from a carriage, that he had fallen. Could it not have been dropped from a bridge? I should say it was impossible. If you examine the roofs, you will find that they are slightly rounded, and there is no railing round them therefore we can say for certain that young cadogan west was placed on it how could he be placed there that was the question which we had to answer there is only one possible way you are aware that the underground runs clear of tunnels at some points in the west end i had a vague memory that as i have travelled by it i have occasionally seen windows just above my head now suppose that the train halted under such a window would there be any difficulty in laying a body upon the roof it seems most improbable we must fall back upon the old axiom that when all other contingencies fail whatever remains however improbable must be the truth here all other contingencies have failed when i found that the leading international agent who had just left london lived in a row of houses which abutted upon the underground i was so pleased that you were a little astonished at my sudden frivolity oh that was it was it yes that was it mr hugo oberstein of thirteen caulfield gardens had become my objective i began my operations at gloucester road station where a very helpful official walked with me along the track and allowed me to satisfy myself not only that the back stair window of caulfield gardens opens on to the line but the even more essential fact that owing to the intersection of one of the larger railways the underground trains are frequently held motionless for some minutes at that very spot splendid holmes you have got it so far so far watson we advance but the goal is afar well having seen the back of caulfield gardens i visited the front and satisfied myself that the bird was indeed flown it is a considerable house unfurnished so far as i could judge in the upper rooms oberstein lived there with a single valet who was probably a confederate entirely in his confidence we must bear in mind that oberstein has gone to the continent to dispose of his booty but not with any idea of flight for he had no reason to fear a warrant and the idea of an amateur domiciliary visit would certainly never occur to him yet that is precisely what we are about to make could we not get a warrant and legalize it hardly on the evidence what can we hope to do we cannot tell what correspondence may be there i don't like it holmes my dear fellow you shall keep watch in the street i'll do the criminal part it's not a time to stick at trifles think of mycroft's note of the admiralty the cabinet the exalted person who waits for news we are bound to go my answer was to rise from the table you are right holmes we are bound to go he sprang up and shook me by the hand i knew you would not shrink at the last said he and for a moment I saw something in his eyes which was nearer to tenderness than I had ever seen. The next instant he was his masterful, practical self once more. "'It is nearly half a mile, but there is no hurry. Let us walk,' said he. "'Don't drop the instruments, I beg. Your arrest as a suspicious character would be a most unfortunate complication.' Caulfield Gardens was one of those lines of flat-faced pillared and porticoed houses which are so prominent a product of the middle Victorian epoch in the west end of London. Next door there appeared to be a children's party, for the merry buzz of young voices and the clatter of a piano resounded through the night. The fog still hung about, and screened us with its friendly shade. Holmes had lit his lantern and flashed it upon the massive door. 
this is a serious proposition said he it is certainly bolted as well as locked we would do better in the area there is an excellent archway down yonder in case a too zealous policeman should intrude give me a hand watson and i'll do the same for you a minute later we were both in the area hardly had we reached the dark shadows before the step of the policeman was heard in the fog above as its soft rhythm died away holmes set to work upon the lower door i saw him stoop and strain until with a sharp crash it flew open we sprang through into the dark passage closing the area door behind us holmes led the way up the curving uncarpeted stair his little fan of yellow light shone upon a low window here we are watson this must be the one he threw it open and as he did so there was a low harsh murmur growing steadily into a loud roar as a train dashed past us in the darkness holmes swept his light along the window sill it was thickly coated with soot from the passing engines but the black surface was blurred and rubbed in places you can see where they rested the body hello watson what's this there can be no doubt that is a blood mark he was pointing to faint discolorations along the woodwork of the window here it is on the stone of the stair also the demonstration is complete let us stay here until a train stops we had not long to wait the very next train roared from the tunnel as before but slowed in the open and then with a creaking of brakes pulled up immediately beneath us it was not four feet from the window ledge to the roof of the carriages holmes softly closed the window so far we are justified said he what do you think of it watson a masterpiece you have never risen to a greater height i cannot agree with you there from the moment that i conceived the idea of the body being upon the roof which surely was not a very abstruse one all the rest was inevitable if it were not for the grave interests involved the affair up to this point would be insignificant our difficulties are still before us but perhaps we may find something here which may help us we had ascended the kitchen stair and entered the suite of rooms upon the first floor one was a dining-room severely furnished and containing nothing of interest a second was a bedroom which also drew blank the remaining room appeared more promising and my companion settled down to a systematic examination it was littered with books and papers and was evidently used as a study swiftly and methodically holmes turned over the contents of drawer after drawer and cupboard after cupboard but no gleam of success came to brighten his austere face at the end of an hour he was no further than when he started the cunning dog has covered his tracks said he he has left nothing to incriminate him his dangerous correspondence has been destroyed or removed this is our last chance it was a small tin cash-box which stood upon the writing-desk holmes pried it open with his chisel several rolls of paper were within covered with figures and calculations without any note to show to what they referred the recurring words water pressure and pressure to the square inch suggested some possible relation to a submarine holmes tossed them all impatiently aside there only remained an envelope with some small newspaper slips inside it he shook them out on the table and at once i saw by his eager face that his hopes had been raised what's this watson eh what's this record of a series of messages in the advertisements of a paper daily telegraph agony column by the print and paper right hand top corner of a page no dates but the messages arrange themselves this must be the first hoped to hear sooner terms agreed to write fully to address given on card pierrot next comes too complex for description must have full report stuff awaits you when goods delivered pierrot then comes matter presses must withdraw offer unless contract completed make appointment by letter will confirm by advertisement pierrot finally monday night after nine two taps only ourselves do not be so suspicious payment in hard cash when goods delivered pierrot 
a fairly complete record, Watson, if we could only get at the man at the other end. He sat lost in thought, tapping his fingers on the table. Finally he sprang to his feet. "'Well, perhaps it won't be so difficult after all. There is nothing more to be done here, Watson. I think we might drive round to the offices of the Daily Telegraph, and so bring a good day's work to a conclusion.' Mycroft Holmes and Lestrade had come round by appointment after breakfast next day, and Sherlock Holmes had recounted to them our proceedings of the day before. The professional shook his head over our confessed burglary. "'We can't do these things in the force, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'No wonder you get results that are beyond us. But some of these days you'll go too far, and you'll find yourself and your friend in trouble.' "'For England, home and beauty, hey, Watson? Martyrs on the altar of our country. But what do you think of it, Mycroft?' "'Excellent, Sherlock. Admirable. But what use will you make of it?' Holmes picked up the daily telegraph which lay upon the table. "'Have you seen Piero's advertisement to-day?' "'What? Another one?' "'Yes, here it is.' "'To-night, same hour, same place. Two taps. Most vitally important. Your own safety at stake. Piero.' "'By George!' cried Lestrade. "'If he answers, we've got him.' That was my idea when I put it in. I think if you could both make it convenient to come with us at about eight o'clock to Caulfield Gardens, we might possibly get a little nearer to a solution. One of the most remarkable characteristics of Sherlock Holmes was his power of throwing his brain out of action and switching all his thoughts on to lighter things whenever he had convinced himself that he could no longer work to advantage. I remember that during the whole of that memorable day he lost himself in a monograph which he had undertaken upon the polyphonic motets of Lassus. For my own part I had none of this power of detachment, and the day, in consequence, appeared to be interminable. The great national importance of the issue, the suspense in high quarters, the direct nature of the experiment which we were trying, all combined to work upon my nerve. It was a relief to me when at last, after a light dinner, we set out upon our expedition. Lestrade and Mycroft met us by appointment at the outside of Gloucester Road Station. The area door of Oberstein's house had been left open the night before, and it was necessary for me, as Mycroft Holmes absolutely and indignantly declined to climb the railings, to pass in and open the hall door. By nine o'clock we were all seated in the study waiting patiently for our man. An hour passed, and yet another. When eleven struck, the measured beat of the great church clock seemed to sound the dirge of our hopes. Lestrade and Mycroft were fidgeting in their seats, and looking twice a minute at their watches. Holmes sat silent and composed, his eyelids half shut, but every sense on the alert. He raised his head with a sudden jerk. "'He's coming,' said he. There had been a furtive step past the door. Now it returned. We heard a shuffling sound outside, and then two sharp taps with the knocker. Holmes rose, motioning us to remain seated. The gas in the hall was a mere point of light. He opened the outer door, and then, as a dark figure slipped past him, he closed and fastened it. "'This way,' we heard him say and a moment later our man stood before us. Holmes had followed him closely, and as the man turned with a cry of surprise and alarm, he caught him by the collar and threw him back into the room. Before our prisoner had recovered his balance, the door was shut, and Holmes standing with his back against it. The man glared round him, staggered, and fell senseless upon the floor. With the shock, his broad-brimmed hat flew from his head, his cravat slipped down from his lips, and there were the long light beard and the soft, handsome, delicate features of Colonel Valentine Walter. Holmes gave a whistle of surprise. "'You can write me down as an ass this time, Watson,' said he. "'This was not the bird that I was looking for.' "'Who is he?' asked Mycroft eagerly. "'The younger brother of the late Sir James Walter, the head of the submarine department. 
yes yes i see the fall of the cards he is coming too i think that you had best leave his examination to me we had carried the prostrate body to the sofa now our prisoner sat up looked round him with a horror-stricken face and passed his hand over his forehead like one who cannot believe his own senses what is this he asked i came here to visit mr oberstein everything is known colonel walter said holmes how an english gentleman could behave in such a manner is beyond my comprehension but your whole correspondence and relations with oberstein are within our knowledge so also are the circumstances connected with the death of young cadogan west let me advise you to gain at least the small credit for repentance and confession since there are still some details which we can only learn from your lips the man groaned and sank his face in his hands we waited but he was silent i can assure you said holmes that every essential is already known we know that you were pressed for money that you took an impress of the keys which your brother held and that you entered into a correspondence with oberstein who answered your letters through the advertisement columns of the daily telegraph we are aware that you went down to the office in the fog on monday night but that you were seen and followed by young cadogan west who had probably some previous reason to suspect you he saw your theft but could not give the alarm as it was just possible that you were taking the papers to your brother in london leaving all his private concerns like the good citizen that he was he followed you closely in the fog and kept at your heels until you reached this very house there he intervened and then it was colonel walter that to treason you added the more terrible crime of murder i did not i did not before god i swear that i did not cried our wretched prisoner tell us then how cadogan west met his end before you laid him upon the roof of a railway carriage i will i swear to you that i will i did the rest i confess it it was just as you say a stock exchange debt had to be paid i needed the money badly oberstein offered me five thousand it was to save myself from ruin but as to murder i am as innocent as you what happened then he had his suspicions before and he followed me as you describe i never knew it until i was at the very door it was a thick fog and one could not see three yards i had given two taps and oberstein had come to the door the young man rushed up and demanded to know what we were about to do with the papers oberstein had a short life preserver he always carried it with him as west forced his way after us into the house oberstein struck him on the head the blow was a fatal one he was dead within five minutes there he lay in the hall and we were at our wits end what to do then oberstein had this idea about the trains which halted under his back window but first he examined the papers which i had brought he said that three of them were essential and that he must keep them you cannot keep them said i there will be a dreadful row at woolwich if they are not returned i must keep them said he for they are so technical that it is impossible in the time to make copies then they must all go back together to-night said i he thought for a little and then he cried out that he had it three i will keep said he the others we will stuff into the pocket of this young man when he is found the whole business will assuredly be put to his account i could see no other way out of it so we did as he suggested we waited half an hour at the window before a train stopped it was so thick that nothing could be seen and we had no difficulty in lowering west's body onto the train that was the end of the matter as far as i was concerned and your brother he said nothing but he had caught me once with his keys and i think that he suspected i read in his eyes that he suspected as you know he never held up his head again there was silence in the room it was broken by mycroft holmes can you not make reparation it would ease your conscience and possibly your punishment what reparation can i make where is oberstein with the papers i do not know did he give you no address he said that letters to the hotel de louvre paris would eventually reach him then reparation is still within your power said sherlock holmes i will do anything i can 
I owe this fellow no particular good will. He has been my ruin and my downfall. Here are paper and pen. Sit at this desk and write to my dictation. Direct the envelope to the address given. That is right. Now the letter. Dear sir, with regard to our transaction, you will no doubt have observed by now that one essential detail is missing. I have a tracing which will make it complete. This has involved me in extra trouble, however, and I must ask you for a further advance of five hundred pounds. I will not trust it to the post, nor will I take anything but gold or notes. I would come to you abroad, but it would excite remark if I left the country at present. Therefore, I shall expect to meet you in the smoking room of the Charing Cross Hotel at noon on Saturday. Remember that only English notes or gold will be taken. That will do very well. I shall be very much surprised if it does not fetch our man. And it did. It is a matter of history, that secret history of a nation which is often so much more intimate and interesting than its public chronicles, that Oberstein, eager to complete the coup of his lifetime, came to the Lure, and was safely engulfed for fifteen years in a British prison. In his trunk were found the invaluable Bruce Partington plans, which he had put up for auction in all the naval centres of Europe. Colonel Walter died in prison towards the end of the second year of his sentence. As to Holmes, he returned refreshed to his monograph upon the polyphonic motets of Lassus, which has since been printed for private circulation, and is said by experts to be the last word upon the subject. Some weeks afterwards I learned incidentally that my friend spent a day at Windsor, whence he returned with a remarkably fine emerald tie-pin. When I asked him if he had bought it, he answered that it was a present from a certain gracious lady, in whose interests he had once been fortunate enough to carry out a small commission. He said no more, but I fancy that I could guess at that lady's august name, and I have little doubt that the emerald pin will for ever recall to my friend's memory the adventure of the Bruce Partington plans. End of section 7《Section 8 of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8 The Adventure of the Dying Detective. Dr. Watson read by Corrie Samuel. Sherlock Holmes read by Beth Thomas. Mr. Culverton Smith read by Shakira Searle. Inspector Morton read by Norman Elfer. Mrs. Hudson read by Rapunzelina. Butler to Smith, read by Jeanie Whitfield. Mrs. Hudson, the landlady of Sherlock Holmes, was a long-suffering woman. Not only was her first-floor flat invaded at all hours by throngs of singular and often undesirable characters, but her remarkable lodger showed an eccentricity and irregularity in his life which must have sorely tried her patience his incredible untidiness, his addiction to music at strange hours, his occasional revolver practice within doors, his weird and often malodorous scientific experiments, and the atmosphere of violence and danger which hung around him, made him the very worst tenant in London. On the other hand, his payments were princely. I have no doubt that the house might have been purchased at the price which Holmes paid for his rooms during the years that I was with him. The landlady stood in the deepest awe of him, and never dared to interfere with him, however outrageous his proceedings might seem. She was fond of him, too, for he had a remarkable gentleness and courtesy in his dealings with women. He disliked and distrusted the sex, but he was always a chivalrous opponent. Knowing how genuine was her regard for him, I listened earnestly to her story, when she came to my rooms in the second year of my married life and told me of the sad condition to which my poor friend was reduced. "'He's dying, Dr. Watson,' said she. "'For three days he has been sinking, and I doubt if he will last the day. He would not let me get a doctor. This morning when I saw his bones sticking out of his face, and his great bright eyes looking at me, I could stand no more of it. 
with your leave or without it mr holmes i'm going for a doctor this very hour said i let it be watson then said he i wouldn't waste an hour in coming to him sir or you may not see him alive i was horrified for i had heard nothing of his illness i need not say that i rushed for my coat and my hat as we drove back i asked for the details there is little i can tell you sir he has been working at a case done at rotherhithe in an alley near the river and he has brought this illness back with him he took to his bed on wednesday afternoon and has never moved since for these three days neither food nor drink has passed his lips good god why did you not call in a doctor he wouldn't have it sir you know how masterful he is i didn't dare to disobey him but he's not long for this world as you'll see for yourself the moment that you set eyes on him he was indeed a deplorable spectacle in the dim light of a foggy november day the sick-room was a gloomy spot but it was that gaunt wasted face staring at me from the bed which sent a chill to my heart his eyes had the brightness of fever there was a hectic flush upon either cheek and dark crusts clung to his lips the thin hands upon the coverlet twitched incessantly his voice was croaking and spasmodic he lay listlessly as i entered the room but the sight of me brought a gleam of recognition to his eyes well watson we seem to have fallen upon evil days said he in a feeble voice but with something of his old carelessness of manner my dear fellow i cried approaching him stand back stand right back said he with the sharp imperiousness which i had associated only with moments of crisis if you approach me watson i shall order you out of the house but why because it is my desire is that not enough yes mrs hudson was right he was more masterful than ever it was pitiful however to see his exhaustion i only wished to help i explained exactly you will help best by doing what you are told certainly holmes he relaxed the austerity of his manner you are not angry he asked gasping for breath poor devil how could i be angry when i saw him lying in such a plight before me it's for your own sake watson he croaked for my sake i know what is the matter with me it is a coolie disease from sumatra a thing that the dutch know more about than we though they have made little of it up to date one thing only is certain it is infallibly deadly and that it is horribly contagious he spoke now with a feverish energy the long hands twitching and jerking as he motioned me away contagious by touch watson that's it by touch keep your distance and all is well good heavens holmes do you suppose that such a consideration weighs with me of an instant it would not affect me in the case of a stranger do you imagine it would prevent me from doing my duty to so old a friend again i advanced but he repulsed me with a look of furious anger if you will stand there i will talk if you do not you must leave the room i have so deep a respect for the extraordinary qualities of holmes that i have always deferred to his wishes even when i least understood them but now all my professional instincts were aroused let him be my master elsewhere i at least was his in a sick room holmes said i you are not yourself a sick man is but a child and so i will treat you whether you like it or not i will examine your symptoms and treat you for them he looked at me with venomous eyes if i am to have a doctor whether i will or not let me at least have some one in whom i have confidence said he then you have none in me in your friendship certainly but facts are facts watson and after all you are only a general practitioner with very limited experience and mediocre qualifications it is painful to have to say these things but you leave me no choice i was bitterly hurt such a remark is unworthy of you holmes it shows me very clearly the state of your own nerves but if you have no confidence in me i would not intrude my services let me bring sir jasper meek or penrose fisher or any of the best men in london but some one you must have and that is final if you think that i am going to stand here and see you die without either helping you myself or bringing any one else to help you then you have mistaken your man 
"'You mean well, Watson,' said the sick man, with something between a sob and a groan. "'Shall I demonstrate your own ignorance? What do you know, pray, of Tapanuli fever? What do you know of the black Formosa corruption?' "'I have never heard of either.' There are many problems of disease, many strange pathological possibilities in the East, Watson." He paused after each sentence to collect his failing strength. "'I have learned so much, during some recent researches, which have a medico-criminal aspect. It was in the course of them that I contracted this complaint. You can do nothing." "'Possibly not. But I happen to know that Dr. Ainstree, the greatest living authority upon tropical disease, is now in London. All remonstrance is useless, Holmes. I am going this instant to fetch him." I turned resolutely to the door. Never have I had such a shock. In an instant, with a tiger-spring, the dying man had intercepted me. I heard the sharp snap of a twisted key. The next moment he had staggered back to his bed, exhausted and panting after his one tremendous outflame of energy. You won't take the key from me by force, Watson. I've got you, my friend. Here you are, and here you will stay, until I will otherwise. But I'll humour you." All this in little gasps, with terrible struggles for breath between. "'You've only my good at heart. Of course I know that very well. You shall have your way. But give me time to get my strength. Not now, Watson, not now. It's four o'clock. At six you can go. This is insanity, Holmes. Only two hours, Watson. I promise you will go at six. Are you content to wait? I seem to have no choice. None in the world, Watson. Thank you. I need no help in arranging the clothes. You will please keep your distance. Now, Watson, there is one other condition that I would make. You will seek help, not from the man you mention, but from the one that I choose. By all means. The first three sensible words that you have uttered since you entered this room, Watson. You will find some books over there. I am somewhat exhausted. I wonder how a battery feels when it pours electricity into a non-conductor. At six, Watson, we resume our conversation." But it was destined to be resumed long before that hour, and in circumstances which gave me a shock hardly second to that caused by his spring to the door. I had stood for some minutes looking at the silent figure in the bed. His face was almost covered by the clothes, and he appeared to be asleep. Then, unable to settle down to reading, I walked slowly round the room, examining the pictures of celebrated criminals with which every wall was adorned. Finally, in my aimless perambulation, I came to the mantelpiece. A litter of pipes, tobacco pouches, syringes, Penknives, revolver cartridges, and other debris were scattered over it. In the midst of these was a small black and white ivory box with a sliding lid. It was a neat little thing, and I had stretched out my hand to examine it more closely when. It was a dreadful cry that he gave, a yell which might have been heard down the street. My skin went cold, and my hair bristled at that horrible scream. As I turned, I caught a glimpse of a convulsed face and frantic eyes. I stood paralysed, with the little box in my hand. "'Ah! Put it down! Down this instant, Watson! This instant, I say!' His head sank back upon the pillow, and he gave a deep sigh of relief as I replaced the box upon the mantelpiece. "'Ah! Oh, I hate to have my things touched, Watson. You know that I hate it. You fidget me beyond endurance. You, a doctor, you are enough to drive a patient into an asylum. Sit down, man, and let me have my rest." The incident left a most unpleasant impression upon my mind. The violent and causeless excitement, followed by this brutality of speech, so far removed from his usual suavity, showed me how deep was the disorganisation of his mind. Of all ruins, that of a noble mind is the most deplorable. I sat in silent dejection until the stipulated time had passed. He seemed to have been watching the clock as well as I, for it was hardly six before he began to talk with the same feverish animation as before. "'Now, Watson,' said he, "'have you any change in your pocket?' "'Yes.' "'Any silver?' "'A good deal.' "'How many half-crowns?' 
I have five. Ah, oh, too few, too few. How very unfortunate, Watson. However, such as they are, you can put them in your watch pocket. All the rest of your money in your left trouser pocket. Thank you. It will balance you so much better like that. This was raving insanity. He shuddered, and again made a sound between a cough and a sob. <coughs> you will now light the gas, Watson, but you will be very careful that not for one instant shall it be more than half on. I implore you to be careful, Watson. Thank you, that is excellent. No, you need not draw the blind. Now, you will have the kindness to place some letters and papers upon this table within my reach. Thank you. Now, some of that litter from the mantelpiece. Excellent, Watson. There are sugar tongs there. Kindly raise that small ivory box with its assistance. Place it here among the papers. Good. You can now go and fetch Mr. Culverton Smith of 13 Lower Burke Street. To tell the truth, my desire to fetch a doctor had somewhat weakened, for poor Holmes was so obviously delirious that it seemed dangerous to leave him. However, he was as eager now to consult the person named as he had been obstinate in refusing. "'I never heard the name,' said I. "'Possibly not, my good Watson. It may surprise you to know that the man upon earth who is best versed in this disease is not a medical man, but a planter. Mr. Culverton Smith is a well-known resident of Sumatra, now visiting London an outbreak of the disease upon his plantation which was distant from medical aid caused him to study it himself with some rather far-reaching consequences he is a very methodical person and i did not desire you to start before six because i was well aware that you would not find him in his study if you could persuade him to come here and give us the benefit of his unique experience of this disease the investigation of which has been his dearest hobby i cannot doubt that he could help me I gave Holmes's remarks as a consecutive whole, and would not attempt to indicate how they were interrupted by gaspings for breath and those clutchings of his hands which indicated the pain from which he was suffering. His appearance had changed for the worse during the few hours that I had been with him. Those hectic spots were more pronounced, the eye shone more brightly out of darker hollows, and a cold sweat glimmered upon his brow. He still retained, however, the jaunty gallantry of his speech. To the last gasp he would always be the master. "'You will tell him exactly how you have left me,' said he. "'You will convey the very impression which is in your own mind, a dying man, a dying and delirious man. Indeed I cannot think why the whole bed of the ocean is not one solid mass of oysters, so prolific the creatures seem. Ah, uh, ah, uh, I am wondering. Strange how the brain controls the brain. Uh, what was I saying, Watson?' my directions for Mr. Culverton Smith. Ah, yes, I remember. My life depends upon it. Plead with him, Watson. There is no good feeling between us. His nephew, Watson. <clears throat> I had suspicions of foul play, and I allowed him to see it. The boy died horribly. He has a grudge against me. You will soften him, Watson. Beg him, pray him, get him here by any means. He can save me, only he. I will bring him in a cab if I have to carry him down to it. You will do nothing of the sort. You will persuade him to come, and then you will return in front of him. Make any excuse so as not to come with him. Don't forget, Watson, you won't fail me. You never did fail me. No doubt there are natural enemies which limit the increase of the creatures. You and I, Watson, we have done our part. Shall the world, then, be overrun by oysters? No, no, horrible. You will convey all that is in your mind." I left him, full of the image of this magnificent intellect, babbling like a foolish child. He had handed me the key, and with a happy thought I took it with me, lest he should lock himself in. Mrs. Hudson was waiting, trembling and weeping in the passage. Behind me, as I passed from the flat, I heard Holmes's high, thin voice in some delirious chant. Below, as I stood whistling for a cab, a man came on me through the fog. "'How is Mr. Holmes, sir?' he asked. It was an old acquaintance, Inspector Morton of Scotland Yard, dressed in unofficial tweeds. "'He is very ill,' I answered. He looked at me in a most singular fashion. Had it not been too fiendish, I could have imagined that the gleam of the fanlight showed exultation in his face. "'I heard some rumour of it,' said he. The cab had driven up, and I left him. 
Lower Burke Street proved to be a line of fine houses, lying in the vague borderland between Notting Hill and Kensington. The particular one at which my cabman pulled up had an air of smug and demure respectability in its old-fashioned iron railings, its massive folding door, and its shining brasswork. All was in keeping with a solemn butler, who appeared framed in the pink radiance of a tinted electrical light behind him. "'Yes, Mr. Culverton Smith is in, Dr. Watson. Very good, sir. I will take up your card.' My humble name and title did not appear to impress Mr. Culverton Smith. Through the half-open door I heard a high, petulant, penetrating voice. "'Who is this person? What does he want? Dear me, Staples, how often have I said that I am not to be disturbed in my hours of study?' There came a gentle flow of soothing explanation from the butler. "'Well, I won't see him, Staples. I can't have my work interrupted like this. I am not at home. Say so. Tell him to come in the morning if he really must see me." Again the gentle murmur. Well, well, give him that message. He can come in the morning, or he can stay away. My work must not be hindered. I thought of Holmes tossing upon his bed of sickness, and counting the minutes, perhaps, until I could bring help to him. It was not a time to stand upon ceremony. His life depended upon my promptness. Before the apologetic butler had delivered his message, I had pushed past him and was in the room. With a shrill cry of anger a man rose from a reclining chair beside the fire. I saw a great yellow face, coarse-grained and greasy, with heavy double chin and two sullen, menacing grey eyes, which glared at me from under tufted and sandy brows. A high, bald head had a small velvet smoking-cap poised coquettishly upon one side of its pink curve. The skull was of enormous capacity, and yet as I looked down I saw to my amazement that the figure of the man was small and frail, twisted in the shoulders and back like one who has suffered from rickets in his childhood. "'What's this?' he cried, in a high, screaming voice. "'What is the meaning of this intrusion? Didn't I send you word that I would see you to-morrow morning?' "'I am sorry,' said I, "'but the matter cannot be delayed. Mr. Sherlock Holmes—' The mention of my friend's name had an extraordinary effect upon the little man. The look of anger passed in an instant from his face. His features became tense and alert. "'Have you come from Holmes?' he asked. "'I have just left him.' "'What about Holmes? How is he?' "'He is desperately ill. That is why I have come.' The man motioned me to a chair, and turned to resume his own. As he did so, I caught a glimpse of his face in the mirror over the mantelpiece. I could have sworn that it was set in a malicious and abominable smile. Yet I persuaded myself that it must have been some nervous contraction which I had surprised, for he turned to me an instant later with genuine concern upon his features. "'I am sorry to hear this,' said he. "'I only know Mr. Holmes through some business dealings which we have had. But I have every respect for his talents and his character. He is an amateur of crime, as I am of disease. For him the villain, for me the microbe. These are my prisons," he continued, pointing to a row of bottles and jars which stood upon a side-table. Among those gelatine cultivations, some of the very worst offenders in the world are now doing time. It was on account of your special knowledge that Mr. Holmes desired to see you. He has a high opinion of you, and thought that you were the one man in London who could help him. The little man started, and the jaunty smoking-cap slid to the floor. "'Why?' he asked. "'Why should Mr. Holmes think that I could help him in his trouble?' "'Because of your knowledge of Eastern diseases.' "'But why should he think that this disease which he has contracted is Eastern?' "'Because, in some professional inquiry, he has been working among Chinese sailors down in the docks.' Mr. Culverton Smith smiled pleasantly, and picked up his smoking-cap. "'Oh, that's it, is it?' said he. 
I trust the matter is not so grave as you suppose. How long has he been ill? About three days. Is he delirious? Occasionally. Tut, tut! This sounds serious. It would be inhuman not to answer his call. I very much resent any interruption to my work, Dr. Watson. But this case is certainly exceptional. I will come with you at once. I remembered Holmes's injunction. I have another appointment, said I. Very good. I will go alone. I have a note of Mr. Holmes' address. You can rely on my being there within half an hour at most. It was with a sinking heart that I re-entered Holmes's bedroom. For all that I knew, the worst might have happened in my absence. To my enormous relief he had improved greatly in the interval. His appearance was as ghastly as ever, but all trace of delirium had left him, and he spoke in a feeble voice, it is true, but with even more than his usual crispness and lucidity. Well, did you see him, Watson? Yes, he is coming. Admirable, Watson, admirable. You are the best of messengers. He wished to return with me. That would never do, Watson. That would be obviously impossible. Did he ask what ailed me? I told him about the Chinese in the East End. Exactly. Well, Watson, you have done all that a good friend could. You can now disappear from the scene. I must wait and hear his opinion, Holmes. Of course you must, but I have reasons to suppose that this opinion would be very much more frank and valuable if he imagines that we are alone. There is just room behind the head of my bed, Watson. My dear Holmes! I fear there is no alternative, Watson. The room does not lend itself to concealment, which is as well, as it is the less likely to arouse suspicion. But just there, Watson, I fancy it could be done. Suddenly he sat up with a rigid intentness upon his haggard face. There are the wheels, Watson. Quick, man, if you love me, and don't budge, whatever happens, whatever happens, do you hear? Don't speak, don't move, just listen with all your ears. Then, in an instant, his sudden access of strength departed, and his masterful, purposeful talk droned away into the low, vague murmurings of a semi-delirious man. From the hiding-place into which I had been so swiftly hustled, I heard the footfalls upon the stair, with the opening and the closing of the bedroom door. Then, to my surprise, there came a long silence, broken only by the heavy breathings and gaspings of the sick man. I could imagine that our visitor was standing by the bedside, and looking down at the sufferer. At last that strange hush was broken. "'Holmes!' he cried. "'Holmes!' in the insistent tone of one who awakens a sleeper. "'Can't you hear me, Holmes?' There was a rustling, as if he had shaken the sick man roughly by the shoulder. "'Is that you, Mr. Smith?' Holmes whispered. "'I hardly dared hope that you would come.' The other laughed. "'I should imagine not,' he said. "'And yet, you see, I am here. Coals of fire, Holmes, coals of fire.' "'It is very good of you, very noble of you.' I appreciate your special knowledge. Our visitor sniggered. <laughs> you do. You are, fortunately, the only man in London who does. Do you know what is the matter with you? The same, said Holmes. Ah, you recognise the symptoms? Only too well. Well, I shouldn't be surprised, Holmes. I shouldn't be surprised if it were the same. A bad lookout for you if it is. Poor Victor was a dead man on the fourth day. A strong, hearty young fellow. It was certainly, as you said, very surprising that he should have contracted an out-of-the-way Asiatic disease in the heart of London. A disease, too, of which I had made such a very special study. Singular coincidence, Holmes. Very smart of you to notice it, but rather uncharitable to suggest that it was cause and effect. I knew that you did it. Oh, you did, did you? 
well you couldn't prove it anyhow but what do you think of yourself spreading reports about me like that and then crawling to me for help the moment you are in trouble what sort of a game is that eh i heard the rasping laboured breathing of the sick man give me the water he gasped you're precious near your end my friend but i don't want you to go till i have had a word with you that's why i give you water there don't slop it about that's right can you understand what i say holmes groaned ah oh, do what you can for me let bygones be bygones he whispered i'll put the words out of my head i swear i will only cure me and i'll forget it forget what well about victor savage's death you as good as admitted just now that you had done it i'll forget it you can forget it or remember it just as you like i don't see you in the witness box quite another shaped box my good holmes i assure you it matters nothing to me that you should know how my nephew died it's not him we are talking about it's you yes yes the fellow who came for me i've forgotten his name said that you contracted it down in the east end among the sailors i could only account for it so you are proud of your brains holmes are you not think yourself smart don't you you came across someone who was smarter this time now cast your mind back holmes can you think of no other way you could have got this thing i can't think my, my mind has gone for heaven's sake help me yes i will help you i'll help you to understand just where you are and how you got there i'd like you to know before you die give me something to ease my pain painful is it yes the coolies used to do some squealing towards the end takes you as cramp i fancy yes yes it is cramp well you can hear what i say anyhow listen now can you remember any unusual incident in your life just about the time your symptoms began no no nothing think again i'm too ill to think well then i'll help you did anything come by post by post a box by chance i'm fainting i'm gone listen holmes there was a sound as if he was shaking the dying man and it was all that i could do to hold myself quiet in my hiding place you must hear me you shall hear me do you remember a box an ivory box it came on wednesday you opened it do you remember yes yes i opened it there was a sharp spring inside it some joke it was no joke as you will find to your cost you fool you would have it and you have got it who asked you to cross my path if you had left me alone i would not have hurt you i remember holmes gasped the spring it drew blood this box this on the table the very one by george and it may as well leave the room in my pocket there goes your last shred of evidence but you have the truth now holmes and you can die with the knowledge that i killed you you knew too much of the fate of victor savage so i have sent you to share it you are very near your end holmes i will sit here and i will watch you die holmes's voice had sunk to an almost inaudible whisper what is that said smith turn up the gas ah the shadows begin to fall do they yes i will turn it up that i may see you the better he crossed the room and the light suddenly brightened is there any other little service that i can do you my friend 
a match, and a cigarette. I nearly called out in my joy and my amazement. He was speaking in his natural voice, a little weak, perhaps, but the very voice I knew. There was a long pause, and I felt that Culverton Smith was standing in silent amazement, looking down at his companion. "'What is the meaning of this?' I heard him say at last, in a dry, rasping tone. "'The best way of successfully acting a part is to be it,' said Holmes. "'I give you my word that for three days I have tasted neither food nor drink, until you are good enough to pour me out that glass of water. But it is the tobacco which I find most irksome. Ah, here are some cigarettes.' I heard the striking of a match. "'That is very much better. Hello, hello. Do I hear the step of a friend?' There were footfalls outside. The door opened, and Inspector Morton appeared. "'All is in order, and this is your man,' said Holmes. The officer gave the usual cautions. "'I arrest you on the charge of murder of one Victor Savage,' he concluded. <laughs> "'And, you might add, the attempted murder of one Sherlock Holmes,' remarked my friend with a chuckle. To save an invalid trouble, Inspector, Mr. Culverton Smith was good enough to give our signal by turning up the gas. By the way, the prisoner has a small box in the right-hand pocket of his coat, which it would be as well to remove. Thank you. I would handle it gingerly if I were you. Put it down here. It may play its part in the trial. There was a sudden rush and a scuffle, followed by the clash of iron and a cry of pain. "'You'll only get yourself hurt,' said the inspector. "'Stand still, will you?' There was the click of the closing handcuffs. "'A nice trap!' cried the high, snarling voice. "'It will bring you into the dock, Holmes, not me. "'He asked me to come here, to cure him. "'I was sorry for him, and I came. "'Now he will pretend, no doubt, "'that I have said anything which he may invent.' which will corroborate his insane suspicions. You can lie as you like, Holmes. My word is always as good as yours. Good heavens! cried Holmes. I had totally forgotten him. My dear Watson, I owe you a thousand apologies. To think that I should have overlooked you. I need not introduce you to Mr. Culverton Smith, since I understand that you met somewhat earlier in the evening have you the cab below i will follow you when i am dressed for i may be of some use at the station oh, i never needed it more said holmes as he refreshed himself with a glass of claret and some biscuits in the intervals of his toilet however as you know my habits are irregular and such a feat means less to me than to most men it was very essential that i should impress mrs hudson with the reality of my condition since she was to convey it to you and you in turn to him you won't be offended watson you will realise that among your many talents dissimulation finds no place, and that if you had shared my secret, you would never have been able to impress Smith with the urgent necessity of his presence, which was the vital point of the whole scheme. Knowing his vindictive nature, I was perfectly certain that he would come to look upon his handiwork. But your appearance, Holmes, your ghastly face! Three days of absolute fast does not improve one's beauty, Watson. For the rest, there is nothing which a sponge may not cure. With Vaseline upon one's forehead, belladonna in one's eyes, rouge over the cheekbones, and crusts of beeswax round one's lips, a very satisfying effect can be produced. Malingering is a subject upon which I have sometimes thought of writing a monograph. A little occasional talk about half-crowns, oysters, or any other extraneous subject produces a pleasing effect of delirium. But why would you not let me near you, since there was in truth no infection? Can you ask, my dear Watson? Do you imagine that I have no respect for your medical talents? Could I fancy that your astute judgment would pass a dying man who, however weak, had no rise of pulse or temperature? At four yards I could deceive you. If I failed to do so, who would bring Smith within my grasp? No, Watson, I would not touch that box. You can just see, if you look at it sideways, where the sharp spring like a viper's tooth emerges as you open it. I dare say it was by some such device that poor Savage, who stood between this monster and a reversion, was done to death. My correspondence, however, is, as you know, a varied one, and I am somewhat upon my guard against any packages which reach me. It was clear to me, however, that by pretending that he had really succeeded in his design, I might surprise a confession.' 
that pretence i have carried out with the thoroughness of the true artist thank you watson you must help me on with my coat when we have finished at the police station i think that something nutritious at simpson's would not be out of place End of section eight. Section nine of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section nine. The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax. Dr. Watson read by Corrie Samuel. Sherlock Holmes. Read by Beth Thomas. Philip Green. Read by Francis Brown. Mr. Peters. Read by Adam. Mrs. Peters. Read by K. Cotter. Hotel Manager. Read by David Olson. Sergeant. Read by James Callahan. Marie. Read by Trotza. Doctor. Read by Norman Elfer. But why Turkish? asked mr sherlock holmes gazing fixedly at my boots i was reclining in a cane-backed chair at the moment and my protruded feet had attracted his ever active attention english i answered in some surprise i got them at latimer's in oxford street holmes smiled with an expression of weary patience the bath he said the bath why the relaxing and expensive Turkish, rather than the invigorating home-made article? Because for the last few days I have been feeling rheumatic and old. A Turkish bath is what we call an alterative in medicine, a fresh starting point, a cleanser of the system. By the way, Holmes, I added, I have no doubt that the connection between my boots and a Turkish bath is a perfectly self-evident one to a logical mind, and yet I should be obliged to you if you would indicate it. The train of reasoning is not very obscure, Watson, said Holmes, with a mischievous twinkle. It belongs to the same elementary class of deduction, which I should illustrate if I were to ask you who shared your cab in your drive this morning. I don't admit that a fresh illustration is an explanation, said I, with some asperity. Bravo, Watson! A very dignified and logical remonstrance. Let me see. What were the points? Take the last one first, the cab you observe that you have some splashes on the left sleeve and shoulder of your coat had you sat in the centre of a hansom you would probably have had no splashes and if you had they would certainly have been symmetrical therefore it is clear you sat at the side therefore it is equally clear that you had a companion that is very evident absurdly commonplace is it not but the boots and the bath equally childish you are in the habit of doing up your boots in a certain way i see them on this occasion fastened with an elaborate double bow which is not your usual method of tying them you have therefore had them off who has tied them a bootmaker or the boy at the bath it is unlikely that it is the bootmaker since your boots are nearly new well what remains the bath absurd is it not but for all that the turkish bath has served a purpose what is that you say that you have had it because you need a change. Let me suggest that you take one. How would Lausanne do, my dear Watson? First-class tickets and all expenses paid on a princely scale. Splendid! But why? Holmes leaned back in his armchair and took his notebook from his pocket. One of the most dangerous classes in the world, said he, is the drifting and friendless woman she is the most harmless and often the most useful of mortals but she is the inevitable inciter of crime in others she is helpless she is migratory she has sufficient means to take her from country to country and from hotel to hotel she is lost as often as not in a maze of obscure pensions and boarding-houses she is a stray chicken in the world of foxes when she is gobbled up she is hardly missed i much fear that some evil has come to the lady frances carfax i was relieved at this sudden descent from the general to the particular holmes consulted his notes lady frances he continued is the sole survivor of the direct family of the late earl of rufton the estates went as you may remember in the male line she was left with limited means but with some very remarkable old spanish jewellery of silver and curiously cut diamonds to which she was fondly attached 
too attached, for she refused to leave them with her banker, and always carried them about with her. A rather pathetic figure, the Lady Frances, a beautiful woman, still in fresh middle age, and yet, by a strange change, the last derelict of what only twenty years ago was a goodly fleet. What has happened to her, then? Ah, what has happened to the Lady Frances? Is she alive or dead? There is our problem. She is a lady of precise habits, and for four years it has been her invariable custom to write every second week to Miss Dobney, her old governess, who has long retired and lives in Camberwell. It is this Miss Dobney who has consulted me. Nearly five weeks have passed without a word. The last letter was from the Hotel National at Lausanne. Lady Frances seems to have left there and given no address. The family are anxious, and as they are exceedingly wealthy, no sum will be spared if we can clear the matter up. Is Miss Dobney the only source of information? Surely she had other correspondents? There is one correspondent who is a sure draw, Watson. That is the bank. Single ladies must live, and their passbooks are compressed diaries. She banks at Sylvester's. I have glanced over her account the last cheque but one paid her bill at lausanne but it was a large one and probably left her with cash in hand only one cheque has been drawn since to whom and where to miss marie devine there is nothing to show where the cheque was drawn it was cashed at the credit lyonnaise at montpellier less than three weeks ago the sum was fifty pounds and who is miss marie devine that also i have been able to discover miss marie devine was the maid of lady frances carfax why she should have paid her this cheque we have not yet determined i have no doubt however that your researches will soon clear the matter up my researches hence the health-giving expedition to lausanne you know that i cannot possibly leave london while old abrahams is in such mortal terror of his life besides on general principles it is best that i should not leave the country scotland yard feels lonely without me and it causes an unhealthy excitement among the criminal classes go then my dear watson and if my humble counsel can ever be valued at so extravagant a rate as two pence a word it waits your disposal night and day at the end of the continental wire Two days later found me at the Hotel National at Lausanne, where I received every courtesy at the hands of Monsieur Moser, the well-known manager. Lady Frances, as he informed me, had stayed there for several weeks. She had been much liked by all who met her. Her age was not more than forty. She was still handsome, and bore every sign of having, in her youth, been a very lovely woman. Monsieur Moser knew nothing of any valuable jewellery but it had been remarked by the servants that the heavy trunk in the lady's bedroom was always scrupulously locked. Marie Devine, the maid, was as popular as her mistress. She was actually engaged to one of the head waiters in the hotel, and there was no difficulty in getting her address. It was eleven, Rue de Trejean, Montpellier. All this I jotted down, and felt that Holmes himself could not have been more adroit in collecting his facts. Only one corner still remained in the shadow. No light which I possessed could clear up the cause for the lady's sudden departure. She was very happy at Lausanne. There was every reason to believe that she intended to remain for the season in her luxurious rooms overlooking the lake. And yet she had left at a single day's notice, which involved her in the useless payment of a week's rent. Only Jules Vibard, the lover of the maid, had any suggestion to offer. He connected the sudden departure with the visit to the hotel a day or two before of a tall, dark, bearded man. "'Un sauvage, un veritable sauvage!' cried Jules Vibard. The man had rooms somewhere in the town. He had been seen talking earnestly to Madame on the promenade by the lake. Then he had called. She had refused to see him. He was English, but of his name there was no record. Madame had left the place immediately afterwards. Jules Vibard, and what was of more importance, Jules Vibard's sweetheart, thought that this call and the departure were cause and effect. Only one thing Jules would not discuss. That was the reason why Marie had left her mistress. Of that he could, or would, say nothing. If I wished to know, I must go to Montpellier and ask her. So ended the first chapter of my inquiry. The second was devoted to the place which Lady Frances Carfax had sought when she left Lausanne. 
Concerning this there had been some secrecy, which confirmed the idea that she had gone with the intention of throwing someone off her track. Otherwise, why should not her luggage have been openly labelled for Baden? Both she and it reached the Rhenish spa by some circuitous route. This much I gathered from the manager of Cook's local office. So to Baden I went, after dispatching to Holmes an account of all my proceedings, and receiving in reply a telegram of half-humorous commendation. At Baden the track was not difficult to follow. Lady Frances had stayed at the Englisher Hof for a fortnight. While there she had made the acquaintance of a Dr. Schlesinger and his wife, a missionary from South America. Like most lonely ladies, Lady Frances found her comfort and occupation in religion. Dr. Schlesinger's remarkable personality, his whole-hearted devotion, and the fact that he was recovering from a disease contracted in the exercise of his apostolic duties affected her deeply. She had helped Mrs. Schlesinger in the nursing of the convalescent saint. He spent his day, as the manager described it to me, upon a lounge-chair on the veranda, with an attendant lady upon either side of him. He was preparing a map of the Holy Land, with special reference to the kingdom of the Midianites, upon whom he was writing a monograph. Finally, having improved much in health, he and his wife had returned to London, and Lady Frances had started thither in their company. This was just three weeks before, and the manager had heard nothing since. As to the maid, Marie, she had gone off some days beforehand in floods of tears, after informing the other maids that she was leaving service for ever. Dr. Schlesinger had paid the bill of the whole party before his departure. "'By the way,' said the landlord in conclusion, "'you are not the only friend of Lady Frances Carfax, who is inquiring after her just now. Only a week or so ago we had a man here upon the same errand.' "'Did he give a name?' I asked. "'None. But he was an Englishman, though of an unusual type." "'A savage,' said I, linking my facts after the fashion of my illustrious friend. "'Exactly. That describes him very well. He is a bulky, bearded, sunburned fellow, who looks as if he would be more at home in a farmer's inn than in a fashionable hotel. A hard, fierce man, I should think and one whom I should be sorry to offend." Already the mystery began to define itself, as figures grow clearer with the lifting of a fog. Here was this good and pious lady, pursued from place to place by a sinister and unrelenting figure. She feared him, or she would not have fled from Lausanne. He had still followed. Sooner or later he would overtake her. Had he already overtaken her? Was that the secret of her continued silence? Could the good people who were her companions not screen her from his violence or his blackmail? What horrible purpose, what deep design lay behind this long pursuit? There was the problem which I had to solve. To Holmes I wrote, showing how rapidly and surely I had got down to the roots of the matter. In reply I had a telegram asking for a description of Dr. Schlesinger's left ear. Holmes's ideas of humour are strange, and occasionally offensive, so I took no notice of his ill-timed jest. Indeed, I had already reached Montpellier, in my pursuit of the maid, Marie, before his message came. I had no difficulty in finding the ex-servant, and in learning all that she could tell me. She was a devoted creature, who had only left her mistress because she was sure that she was in good hands, and because her own approaching marriage made a separation inevitable in any case. Her mistress had, as she confessed with distress, shown some irritability of temper towards her during their stay in Baden, and had even questioned her once as if she had suspicions of her honesty, and this had made the parting easier than it would otherwise have been. Lady Frances had given her fifty pounds as a wedding present. Like me, Marie viewed with deep distrust the stranger who had driven her mistress from Lausanne. With her own eyes she had seen him seize the lady's wrist with great violence on the public promenade by the lake. He was a fierce and terrible man. She believed that it was out of dread of him that Lady Frances had accepted the escort of the Schlesingers to London. She had never spoken to Marie about it, 
but many little signs had convinced the maid that her mistress lived in a state of continual nervous apprehension. So far she had got in her narrative, when suddenly she sprang from her chair, and her face was convulsed with surprise and fear. "'See!' she cried. "'The miscreant follows still. There is the very man of whom I speak.' Through the open sitting-room window I saw a huge, swarthy man, with a bristling black beard, walking slowly down the centre of the street, and staring eagerly at the numbers of the houses. It was clear that, like myself, he was on the track of the maid. Acting upon the impulse of the moment, I rushed out and accosted him. "'You are an Englishman,' I said. "'What if I am?' he asked, with a most villainous scowl. "'May I ask what your name is?' "'No, you may not,' said he, with decision. The situation was awkward, but the most direct way is often the best. "'Where is the Lady Frances Carfax?' I asked. He stared at me with amazement. "'What have you done with her? Why have you pursued her? I insist upon an answer,' said I. The fellow gave a bellow of anger, and sprang upon me like a tiger. I have held my own in many a struggle, but the man had a grip of iron and the fury of a fiend. His hand was on my throat, and my senses were nearly gone, before an unshaven French ouvrier in a blue blouse darted out from a cabaret opposite, with a cudgel in his hand, and struck my assailant a sharp crack over the forearm, which made him leave go his hold. He stood for a moment fuming with rage, and uncertain whether he should not renew his attack. Then. With a snarl of anger, he left me and entered the cottage from which I had just come. I turned to thank my preserver, who stood beside me in the roadway. "'Well, Watson,' said he, "'a very pretty hash you have made of it. I rather think you had better come back with me to London by the night express.' An hour afterwards, Sherlock Holmes, in his usual garb and style, was seated in my private room at the hotel. His explanation of his sudden and opportune appearance was simplicity itself, for, finding that he could get away from London, he determined to head me off at the next obvious point of my travels. In the disguise of a working man he had sat in the cabaret, waiting for my appearance. "'And a singularly consistent investigation you have made, my dear Watson,' said he. "'I cannot at the moment recall any possible blunder which you have omitted. The total effect of your proceeding has been to give the alarm everywhere, and yet to discover nothing.' "'Perhaps you would have done no better,' I answered bitterly. "'There is no perhaps about it. I have done better. Here is the Honourable Philip Green, who is a fellow lodger with you in this hotel, and we may find him the starting point for a more successful investigation.' A card had come up on a salver, and it was followed by the same bearded ruffian who had attacked me in the street. He started when he saw me. "'What is this, Mr. Holmes?' he asked. "'I had your note, and I have come. But what has this man to do with the matter?' "'This is my old friend and associate, Dr. Watson, who is helping us in this affair.' The stranger held out a huge, sunburned hand, with a few words of apology. "'I hope I didn't harm you. When you accuse me of hurting her, I lost my grip of myself. Indeed, I'm not responsible in these days. My nerves are like live wires. But the situation is beyond me. What I want to know in the first place, Mr. Holmes, is how in the world you came to hear of my existence at all. I am in touch with Miss Dobney, Lady Frances's governess. Old Susan Dobney with the mob cap. I remember her well. And she remembers you. It was in the days before— before you found it better to go to South Africa. Ah, I see you know my whole story. I need hide nothing from you. I swear to you, Mr. Holmes, that there never was in this world a man who loved a woman with a more whole-hearted love than I had for Francis. I was a wild youngster, I know, not worse than others of my class, but her mind was pure as snow. She could not bear a shadow of coarseness. So when she came to hear of things that I had done, she would have no more to say of me, and yet she loved me, that is the wonder of it, loved me well enough to remain single all her sainted days, just for my sake alone. When the years had passed, and I had made my money at Barberton, I thought perhaps I could seek her out and soften her. I had heard that she was still unmarried, 
and I found her at Lausanne and tried all I knew. She weakened, I think, but her will was strong, and when next I called, she had left the town. I traced her to Baden, and then, after a time, heard that her maid was here. I'm a rough fellow, fresh from a rough life, and when Dr. Watson spoke to me as he did, I lost hold of myself for a moment. But for God's sake, tell me what has become of the Lady Frances. That is for us to find out, said Sherlock Holmes, with peculiar gravity. What is your London address, Mr. Green? The Longham Hotel will find me. Then may I recommend that you return there, and be on hand in case I should want you. I have no desire to encourage false hopes, but you may rest assured that all that can be done will be done for the safety of Lady Frances. I can say no more for the instant. I will leave you this card, so that you may be able to keep in touch with us. Now, Watson, if you will pack your bag, I will cable to Mrs. Hudson to make one of her best efforts for two hungry travellers at seven-thirty to-morrow. A telegram was awaiting us when we reached our Baker Street rooms, which Holmes read with an exclamation of interest and threw across to me. "'Jagged or torn?' was the message, and the place of origin, Baden. "'What is this?' I asked. "'It is everything,' Holmes answered. "'You may remember my seemingly irrelevant question as to this clerical gentleman's left ear. You did not answer it.' "'I had left Baden and could not inquire. Exactly. For this reason I sent a duplicate to the manager of the Englisher Hof, whose answer lies here. What does it show? It shows, my dear Watson, that we are dealing with an exceptionally astute and dangerous man. The Reverend Dr. Schlesinger, missionary from South America, is none other than Holy Peters, one of the most unscrupulous rascals that Australia has ever evolved, and for a young country it has turned out some very finished types his particular specialty is the beguiling of lonely ladies by playing upon their religious feelings and his so-called wife and englishwoman named fraser is a worthy helpmate the nature of his tactics suggested his identity to me and this physical peculiarity he was badly bitten in a saloon fight at adelaide in eighty nine confirmed my suspicion this poor lady is in the hands of a most infernal couple who will stick at nothing watson that she is already dead is a very likely supposition if not she is undoubtedly in some sort of confinement and unable to write to miss dobney or her other friends it is always possible that she never reached london or that she has passed through it but the former is improbable as with their system of registration it is not easy for foreigners to play tricks with the continental police and the latter is also unlikely as these rogues could not hope to find any other place where it would be as easy to keep a person under restraint all my instincts tell me that she is in london but we have at present no possible means of telling where we can only take the obvious steps eat our dinner and possess our souls in patience later in the evening i will stroll down and have a word with friend lestrade at scotland yard but neither the official police, nor Holmes's own small but very efficient organisation, sufficed to clear away the mystery. Amid the crowded millions of London, the three persons we sought were as completely obliterated as if they had never lived. Advertisements were tried, and failed. Clues were followed, and led to nothing. Every criminal resort which Schlesinger might frequent was drawn in vain. His old associates were watched but they kept clear of him. And then suddenly, after a week of helpless suspense, there came a flash of light. A silver and brilliant pendant of old Spanish design had been pawned at Bovington's in Westminster Road. The pawner was a large, clean-shaven man of clerical appearance. His name and address were demonstrably false. The ear had escaped notice, but the description was surely that of Schlesinger. Three times had our bearded friend from the Langham called for news, the third time within an hour of this fresh development. His clothes were getting looser on his great body. He seemed to be wilting away in his anxiety. "'If you'll only give me something to do!' was his constant wail. At last Holmes could oblige him. "'He has begun to pawn the jewels. We should get him now.' "'But does this mean that any harm has befallen the Lady Frances?' Holmes shook his head very gravely. Supposing that they have held her prisoner up to now, it is clear that they cannot let her loose without their own destruction. We must prepare for the worst. What can I do? These people do not know you by sight? No. 
it is possible that he will go to some other pawnbroker in the future in that case we must begin again on the other hand he has had a fair price and no questions asked so if he is in need of ready money he will probably come back to bovington's i will give you a note to them and they will let you wait in the shop if the fellow comes you will follow him home but no indiscretion and above all no violence i put you on your honour that you will take no step without my knowledge and consent for two days the honourable philip green he was i may mention the son of the famous admiral of that name who commanded the sea of azov fleet in the crimean war brought us no news on the evening of the third he rushed into our sitting-room pale trembling with every muscle of his powerful frame quivering with excitement we have him we have him he cried he was incoherent in his agitation holmes soothed him with a few words and thrust him into an armchair. come now give us the order of events said he she came only an hour ago it was the wife this time but the pendant she brought was the fellow of the other she is a tall pale woman with ferret eyes that is the lady said holmes she left the office and i followed her she walked up to the killington road and i kept behind her presently she went into a shop mr holmes it was an undertaker's my companion started well he asked in that vibrant voice which told of the fiery soul behind the cold grey face she was talking to the woman behind the counter i entered as well it is late i heard her say or words to that effect the woman was excusing herself it should be there before now she answered it took longer being out of the ordinary they both stopped and looked at me so i asked some questions and then left the shop you did excellently well what happened next the woman came out but i hid myself in the doorway her suspicions had been aroused i think for she looked round her then she called the cab and got in I was lucky enough to get another and so to follow her. She got down at last to number 36, Pulteney Square, Brixton. I drove past, left my cab at the corner of the square and watched the house. Did you see anyone? The windows were all in darkness, save one on the lower floor. The blind was down and I could not see in. I was standing there, wondering what I should do next, when a covered van drove up with two men in it. They descended, took something out of the van, and carried it up the steps to the hall door mr holmes it was a coffin ah for an instant i was on the point of rushing in the door had been opened to admit the men in their burden it was the woman who had opened it but as i stood there she caught a glimpse of me and i think that she recognized me i saw her start and she hastily closed the door i remembered my promise to you and here i am you have done excellent work said holmes scribbling a few words upon a half sheet of paper we can do nothing legal without a warrant and you can serve the cause best by taking this note down to the authorities and getting one there may be some difficulty but i should think that the sale of the jewellery should be sufficient lestrade will see to all the details but they may murder her in the meanwhile what could the coffin mean and for whom could it be but for her we will do all that can be done mr green not a moment will be lost leave it in our hands now watson he added as our client hurried away he will set the regular forces on the move we are as usual the irregulars and we must take our own line of action the situation strikes me as so desperate that the most extreme measures are justified not a moment is to be lost in getting to pulteney square let us try to reconstruct the situation said he as we drove swiftly past the houses of parliament and over westminster bridge these villains have coaxed this unhappy lady to london after first alienating her from her faithful maid if she has written any letters they have been intercepted through some confederate they have engaged a furnished house once inside it they have made her a prisoner and they have become possessed of the valuable jewellery which has been their object from the first already they have begun to sell part of it which seems safe enough to them since they have no reason to think that any one is interested in the lady's fate when she is released she will of course denounce them therefore she must not be released but they cannot keep her under lock and key for ever so murder is their only solution that seems very clear now we will take another line of reasoning when you follow two separate chains of thought watson you will find some point of intersection which should approximate to the truth 
we will start now not from the lady but from the coffin and argue backward that incident proves i fear beyond all doubt that the lady is dead it points also to an orthodox burial with proper accompaniment of medical certificate and official sanction had the lady been obviously murdered they would have buried her in a hole in the back garden but here all is open and regular what does this mean surely that they have done her to death in some way which has deceived the doctor and simulated a natural end poisoning perhaps and yet how strange that they should ever let a doctor approach her unless he were a confederate which is hardly a credible proposition could they have forged a medical certificate dangerous watson very dangerous no i hardly see them doing that pull up cabby this is evidently the undertaker's for we have just passed the pawnbroker's would you go in watson your appearance inspires confidence ask what hour the pulteney square funeral takes place to-morrow the woman in the shop answered me without hesitation that it was to be at eight o'clock in the morning you see watson no mystery everything above board in some way the legal forms have undoubtedly been complied with and they think that they have little to fear well there is nothing for it now but a direct frontal attack are you armed my stick well well we shall be strong enough thrice is he armed who hath his quarrel just we simply can't afford to wait for the police or to keep within the four corners of the law you can drive off cabby now watson we'll just take our luck together as we have occasionally in the past he had rung loudly at the door of a great dark house in the centre of pulteney square it was opened immediately and the figure of a tall woman was outlined against the dim-lit hall well what do you want she asked sharply peering at us through the darkness i want to speak to dr schlesinger said holmes there's no such person here she answered and tried to close the door but holmes had jammed it with his foot well i want to see the man who lives here whatever he may call himself said holmes firmly she hesitated then she threw open the door well come in said she my husband is not afraid to face any man in the world she closed the door behind us and showed us into a sitting-room on the right side of the hall turning up the gas as she left us mr peters will be with you in an instant she said her words were literally true for we hardly had time to look around the dusty and moth-eaten apartment in which we found ourselves before the door opened and a big clean-shaven bald-headed man stepped lightly into the room he had a large red face with pendulous cheeks and a general air of superficial benevolence which was marred by a cruel vicious mouth there is surely some mistake here gentlemen he said in an unctuous make everything easy voice i fancy that you have been misdirected possibly if you tried farther down the street that will do we have no time to waste said my companion firmly you are henry peters of adelaide late the rev dr schlesinger of baden and south america i am as sure of that as that my own name is sherlock holmes peters as i will now call him started and stared hard at his formidable pursuer i guess your name does not frighten me mr holmes said he coolly when a man's conscience is easy you can't rattle him what is your business in my house i want to know what you have done with the lady frances carfax whom you brought away with you from baden i'd be very glad if you could tell me where that lady may be peters answered coolly i have a bill against her for nearly a hundred pounds and nothing to show for it but a couple of trumpery pendants that the dealer would hardly look at she attached herself to mrs peters and me at baden it is a fact that i was using another name at the time and she stuck on to us until we came to london i paid her bill and her ticket once in london she gave us the slip and as i say left these out-of-date jewels to pay her bills you find her mr holmes and i'm your debtor i mean to find her said sherlock holmes i'm going through this house until i do find her where is your warrant holmes half drew a revolver from his pocket this will have to serve till a better one comes why you're a common burglar so you might describe me said holmes cheerfully my companion is also a dangerous ruffian and together we are going through your house 
Our opponent opened the door. "'Fetch a policeman, Anne,' said he. There was a whisk of feminine skirts down the passage, and the hall door was opened and shut. "'Our time is limited, Watson,' said Holmes. "'If you try to stop us, Peters, you will most certainly get hurt. Where is that coffin which was brought into your house?' "'What do you want with the coffin? It is in use. There is a body in it.' "'I must see the body.' Never with my consent. Then without it. With a quick movement, Holmes pushed the fellow to one side and passed into the hall. A door half opened stood immediately before us. We entered. It was the dining room. On the table, under a half lit chandelier, the coffin was lying. Holmes turned up the gas and raised the lid. Deep down in the recesses of the coffin lay an emaciated figure. The glare from the lights above beat down upon an aged and withered face. By no possible process of cruelty, starvation, or disease, could this worn-out wreck be the still beautiful Lady Frances. Holmes's face showed his amazement, and also his relief. "'Thank God,' he muttered. "'It's someone else.' "'Ah, you've blundered badly for once, Mr. Sherlock Holmes.' said Peters, who had followed us into the room. "'Who is the dead woman?' "'Well, if you really must know, she is an old nurse of my wife's. Rose Splendor by name, whom we found in the Brixton Workhouse Infirmary. We brought her round here, called in Dr. Horsam, of thirteen Furbank Villas, mind you take the address, Mr. Holmes, and had her carefully tended, as Christian folk should.' On the third day she died. Certificate says senile decay. But that's only the doctor's opinion, and of course you know better. We ordered her funeral to be carried out by Stimson and Co. of the Kennington Road, who will bury her at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Can you pick any hole in that, Mr. Holmes? You've made a silly blunder, and you may as well own up to it. I'd give something for a photograph of your gaping, staring face when you pulled aside that lid expecting to see the Lady Frances Carfax and only found a poor old woman of ninety. Holmes's expression was as impassive as ever under the jeers of his antagonist, but his clenched hands betrayed his acute annoyance. "'I am going through your house,' said he. "'Are you, though?' cried Peters, as a woman's voice and heavy steps sounded in the passage. "'We'll soon see about that.' This way, officers, if you please. These men have forced their way into my house, and I cannot get rid of them. Help me to put them out. A sergeant and a constable stood in the doorway. Holmes drew his card from his case. This is my name and address. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. Bless you, sir. We know you very well, said the sergeant. But you can't stay here without a warrant. Of course not. I quite understand that. Arrest him! cried Peters. "'We know where to lay our hands on this gentleman, if he is wanted,' said the sergeant majestically. "'But you'll have to go, Mr. Holmes.' "'Yes, Watson, we shall have to go.' A minute later we were in the street once more. Holmes was as cool as ever, but I was hot with anger and humiliation. The sergeant had followed us. "'Sorry, Mr. Holmes, but that's the law.' "'Exactly, sergeant. You could not do otherwise.' I expect there was good reason for your presence there, if there is anything I can do. It's a missing lady, sergeant, and we think she is in that house. I expect a warrant presently. Then I'll keep my eye on the parties, Mr. Holmes. If anything comes along, I will surely let you know. It was only nine o'clock, and we were off full cry upon the trail at once. First we drove to Brixton Workhouse Infirmary, where we found that it was indeed the truth that a charitable couple had called some days before that they had claimed an imbecile old woman as a former servant, and that they had obtained permission to take her away with them. No surprise was expressed at the news that she had since died. The doctor was our next goal. He had been called in, had found the woman dying of pure senility, had actually seen her pass away, and had signed the certificate in due form. "'I assure you everything was perfectly normal, and there was no room for foul play in the matter,' said he. Nothing in the house had struck him as suspicious, save that, for people of their class, it was remarkable that they should have no servant. 
so far and no further went the doctor. Finally we found our way to Scotland Yard. There had been difficulties of procedure in regard to the warrant. Some delay was inevitable. The magistrate's signature might not be obtained until next morning. If Holmes would call about nine he could go down with Lestrade and see it acted upon. So ended the day, save that near midnight our friend, the sergeant, called to say that he had seen flickering lights here and there in the windows of the great dark house, but that no one had left it and none had entered. We could but pray for patience and wait for the morrow. Sherlock Holmes was too irritable for conversation and too restless for sleep. I left him smoking hard, with his heavy dark brows knotted together, and his long nervous fingers tapping upon the arms of his chair, as he turned over in his mind every possible solution of the mystery. Several times in the course of the night I heard him prowling about the house. Finally, just after I had been called in the morning, he rushed into my room. He was in his dressing-gown, but his pale, hollow-eyed face told me that his night had been a sleepless one. "'What time was the funeral? Eight, was it not?' he asked eagerly. "'Well, it is seven-twenty now. Good heavens, Watson, what has become of any brains that God has given me? Quick, man, quick! It's life or death! A hundred chances on death, to one on life! I'll never forgive myself! Never! If we are too late!' Five minutes had not passed before we were flying in a hansom down Baker Street. But even so it was twenty-five to eight as we passed Big Ben, and eight struck as we tore down the Brixton Road. But others were late as well as we. Ten minutes after the hour the hearse was still standing at the door of the house, and even as our foaming horse came to a halt, the coffin, supported by three men, appeared on the threshold. Holmes darted forward and barred their way. "'Take it back!' he cried, laying his hand on the breast of the foremost. "'Take it back this instant!' "'What the devil do you mean? Once again, I ask you, where is your warrant?' shouted the furious Peters his big red face glaring over the farther end of the coffin. "'The warrant is on its way. The coffin shall remain in the house until it comes.' The authority in Holmes's voice had its effect upon the bearers. Peters had suddenly vanished into the house, and they obeyed these new orders. "'Quick, Watson, quick! Here is a screwdriver!' he shouted, as the coffin was replaced upon the table. "'Here's one for you, my man. A sovereign, if the lid comes off in a minute. Ask no questions. Work away. That's good. Another. And another. Now, pull all together. It's giving. It's giving. Ah! That does it at last!' With a united effort we tore off the coffin lid. As we did so, there came from the inside a stupefying and overpowering smell of chloroform. A body lay within, its head all wreathed in cotton wool, which had been soaked in the narcotic. Holmes plucked it off and disclosed the statuesque face of a handsome and spiritual woman of middle age. In an instant he had passed his arm round the figure and raised her to a sitting position. "'Is she gone, Watson? Is there a spark left? Surely we are not too late!' For half an hour it seemed that we were. What with actual suffocation, and what with the poisonous fumes of the chloroform, the Lady Frances seemed to have passed the last point of recall. And then at last, with artificial respiration, with injected ether, and with every device that science could suggest, some flutter of life, some quiver of the eyelids, some dimming of a mirror, spoke of the slowly returning life. A cab had driven up, and Holmes, parting the blind, looked out at it. "'Here is Lestrade with his warrant,' said he. "'He will find that his birds have flown, and here,' he added, as a heavy step hurried along the passage. "'Is someone who has a better right to nurse this lady than we have. Good morning, Mr. Green. I think that the sooner we can move the Lady Frances the better. Meanwhile the funeral may proceed, and the poor woman who still lies in that coffin may go to her last resting-place alone. Should you care to add the case to your annals, my dear Watson?' said Holmes that evening. It can only be as an example of that temporary eclipse to which even the best balanced mind may be exposed. Such slips are common to all mortals, and the greatest is he who can recognise and repair them. To this modified credit I may perhaps make some claim. My night was haunted by the thought that somewhere a clue, a strange sentence, a curious observation, had come under my notice and had been too easily dismissed. 
then suddenly in the grey of the morning the words came back to me it was the remark of the undertaker's wife as reported by philip green she had said it should be there before now it took longer being out of the ordinary it was the coffin of which she spoke it had been out of the ordinary that could only mean that it had been made to some special measurement but why why then in an instant i remembered the deep sides and the little wasted figure at the bottom why so large a coffin for so small a body to leave room for another body both would be buried under the one certificate it had all been so clear if only my own sight had not been dimmed at eight the lady frances would be buried our one chance was to stop the coffin before it left the house it was a desperate chance that we might find her alive but it was a chance as the result showed these people had never to my knowledge done a murder they might shrink from actual violence at the last they could bury her with no sign of how she met her end and even if she were exhumed there was a chance for them i hoped that such considerations might prevail with them you can reconstruct the scene well enough you saw the horrible den upstairs where the poor lady had been kept so long they rushed in and overpowered her with their chloroform carried her down poured more into the coffin to ensure against her waking and then screwed down the lid a clever device watson it is new to me in the annals of crime if our ex-missionary friends escape the clutches of lestrade i shall expect to hear of some brilliant incidents in their future career End of section nine. Section 10 of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10 The Adventure of the Devil's Foot, Part 1. Dr. Watson, read by Corey Samuel. Sherlock Holmes, read by Beth Thomas. Vicar Roundhay, read by Tricia G. Dr. Leon Sterndale, read by Norman Elfer. Mr. Mortimer Tregenis, read by James Callahan. In recording from time to time some of the curious experiences and interesting recollections which I associate with my long and intimate friendship with Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I have continually been faced by difficulties caused by his own aversion to publicity. To his sombre and cynical spirit all popular applause was always abhorrent, and nothing amused him more at the end of a successful case than to hand over the actual exposure to some orthodox official, and to listen with a mocking smile to the general chorus of misplaced congratulation. It was indeed this attitude upon the part of my friend, and certainly not any lack of interesting material, which has caused me of late years to lay very few of my records before the public. My participation in some of his adventures was always a privilege which entailed discretion and reticence upon me. It was, then, with considerable surprise, that I received a telegram from Holmes last Tuesday. He has never been known to write where a telegram would serve, in the following terms. Why not tell them of the Cornish horror? Strangest case I have handled. I have no idea what backward sweep of memory had brought the matter fresh to his mind, or what freak had caused him to desire that I should recount it. But I hasten, before another cancelling telegram may arrive, to hunt out the notes which give me the exact details of the case, and to lay the narrative before my readers. It was, then, in the spring of the year 1897, that Holmes's iron constitution showed some symptoms of giving way in the face of constant hard work of a most exacting kind, aggravated, perhaps, by occasional indiscretions of his own. In March of that year, Dr. Moore Agar, of Harley Street, whose dramatic introduction to Holmes I may some day recount, gave positive injunctions that the famous private agent lay aside all his cases, and surrender himself to complete rest, if he wished to avert an absolute breakdown. The state of his health was not a matter in which he himself took the faintest interest, for his mental detachment was absolute, but he was induced at last, on the threat of being permanently disqualified from work, to give himself a complete change of scene and air. Thus it was that in the early spring of that year we found ourselves together in a small cottage near Poultry Bay, at the further extremity of the Cornish peninsula. It was a singular spot, 
and one peculiarly well suited to the grim humour of my patient. From the windows of our little whitewashed house, which stood high upon a grassy headland, we looked down upon the whole sinister semicircle of Mount's Bay, that old death-trap of sailing-vessels, with its fringe of black cliffs and surge-swept reefs, on which innumerable seamen have met their end. With the northerly breeze it lies placid and sheltered, inviting the storm-tossed craft to tack into it for rest and protection. Then come the sudden swell round of the wind, the blistering gale from the south-west, the dragging anchor, the lee shore, and the last battle in the creaming breakers. The wise mariner stands far out from that evil place. On the land side our surroundings were as sombre as on the sea. It was a country of rolling moors, lonely and dun-coloured, with an occasional church tower to mark the site of some old-world village. In every direction upon these moors there were traces of some vanished race which had passed utterly away, and left as its sole record strange monuments of stone, irregular mounds which contained the burned ashes of the dead, and curious earthworks which hinted at prehistoric strife. The glamour and mystery of the place, with its sinister atmosphere of forgotten nations, appealed to the imagination of my friend, and he spent much of his time in long walks and solitary meditations upon the moor. The ancient Cornish language had also arrested his attention, and he had, I remember, conceived the idea that it was akin to the Chaldean, and had been largely derived from the Phoenician traders in tin. He had received a consignment of books upon philology, and was settling down to develop this thesis, when suddenly, to my sorrow, and to his unfeigned delight, we found ourselves, even in that land of dreams, plunged into a problem at our very doors, which was more intense, more engrossing, and infinitely more mysterious than any of those which had driven us from London. Our simple life and peaceful, healthy routine were violently interrupted, and we were precipitated into the midst of a series of events which caused the utmost excitement, not only in Cornwall, but throughout the whole west of England. Many of my readers may retain some recollection of what was called at the time the Cornish Horror, though a most imperfect account of the matter reached the London press. Now, after thirteen years, I will give the true details of this inconceivable affair to the public. I have said that scattered towers marked the villages which dotted this part of Cornwall. The nearest of these was the hamlet of Tridanic Wallace, where the cottages of a couple of hundred inhabitants clustered round an ancient, moss-grown church. The vicar of the parish, Mr. Roundhay, was something of an archaeologist, and as such Holmes had made his acquaintance. He was a middle-aged man, portly and affable, with a considerable fund of local lore. At his invitation we had taken tea at the vicarage, and had come to know also Mr. Mortimer Tregenis, an independent gentleman, who increased the clergyman's scanty resources by taking rooms in his large, straggling house. The vicar, being a bachelor, was glad to come to such an arrangement, though he had little in common with his lodger, who was a thin, dark, spectacled man, with a stoop which gave the impression of actual physical deformity. I remember that during our short visit we found the vicar garrulous, but his lodger strangely reticent, a sad-faced, introspective man, sitting with averted eyes, brooding apparently upon his own affairs. These were the two men who entered abruptly into our little sitting-room on Tuesday, March the 16th, shortly after our breakfast hour, as we were smoking together, preparatory to our daily excursion upon the moors. "'Mr. Holmes,' said the vicar in an agitated voice, "'the most extraordinary and tragic affair has occurred during the night. It is the most unheard of business. We can only regard it as a special providence that you should chance to be here at the time, for in all England you are the one man we need.' I glared at the intrusive vicar with no very friendly eyes, but Holmes took his pipe from his lips and sat up in his chair, like an old hound who hears the view halloo. He waved his hand to the sofa, and our palpitating visitor with his agitated companion sat side by side upon it. Mr. Mortimer Tregenis was more self-contained than the clergyman, but the twitching of his thin hands and the brightness of his dark eyes showed that they shared a common emotion. "'Shall I speak, or you?' 
he asked of the vicar. Well, as you seem to have made the discovery, whatever it may be, and the vicar to have had it second hand, perhaps you had better do the speaking, said Holmes. I glanced at the hastily clad clergyman, with the formally dressed lodger seated beside him, and was amused at the surprise which Holmes's simple deduction had brought to their faces. Perhaps I had best say a few words first, said the vicar, and then you can judge if you will listen to the details from Mr. Tregenis, or whether we should not hasten at once to the scene of this mysterious affair. I may explain, then, that our friend here spent last evening in the company of his two brothers, Owen and George, and of his sister Brenda, at their house at Tredanic Wartha, which is near the old stone cross upon the moor. He left them shortly after ten o'clock, playing cards round the dining-room table, in excellent health and spirits. This morning, being an early riser, he walked in that direction before breakfast, and was overtaken by the carriage of Dr. Richards, who explained that he had just been sent for on a most urgent call to Tredanic Wartha. Mr. Mortimer Tregenis naturally went with him. When he arrived at Tredanic Wartha, he found an extraordinary state of things. His two brothers and his sister were seated round the table exactly as he had left them, the cards still spread in front of them, and the candles burned down to their sockets. The sister lay back stone dead in her chair, while the two brothers sat on each side of her laughing, shouting, and singing, the senses stricken clean out of them. All three of them, the dead woman and the two demented men, retained upon their faces an expression of the utmost horror, a convulsion of terror which was dreadful to look upon. There was no sign of the presence of any one in the house, except Mrs. Porter, the old cook and housekeeper, who declared that she had slept deeply and heard no sound during the night. Nothing had been stolen or disarranged, and there is absolutely no explanation of what the horror can be which has frightened a woman to death and two strong men out of their senses. Here is the situation, Mr. Holmes, in a nutshell, and if you can help us to clear it up, you will have done a great work. I had hoped that in some way I could coax my companion back into the quiet which had been the object of our journey, but one glance at his intense face and contracted eyebrows told me how vain was now the expectation. He sat for some little time in silence, absorbed in the strange drama which had broken in upon our peace. "'I will look into this matter,' he said at last. "'On the face of it, it would appear to be a case of a very exceptional nature. Have you been there yourself, Mr. Roundhay?' "'No, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Tregenis brought back the account to the vicarage, and I at once hurried over with him to consult you.' "'How far is it to the house where this singular tragedy occurred?' "'About a mile inland.' "'Then we shall walk over together. But before we start, I must ask you a few questions, Mr. Mortimer Tregenis.' The other had been silent all this time, but I had observed that his more controlled excitement was even greater than the obtrusive emotion of the clergyman. He sat with a pale, drawn face, his anxious gaze fixed upon Holmes, and his thin hands clasped convulsively together. His pale lips quivered as he listened to the dreadful experience which had befallen his family, and his dark eyes seemed to reflect something of the horror of the scene. "'Ask what you like, Mr. Holmes,' said he eagerly. It is a bad thing to speak of, but I will answer you the truth. Tell me about last night. Well, Mr. Holmes, I supped there, as the vicar has said, and my elder brother George proposed a game of whist afterwards. We sat down about nine o'clock. It was a quarter past ten when I moved to go. I left them all round the table as merry as could be. Who let you out? Mrs. Porter had gone to bed, so I let myself out. I shut the hall door behind me. The window of the room in which they sat was closed, but the blind was not drawn down. There was no change in door or window this morning, or any reason to think that any stranger had been to the house. Yet there they sat, driven clean mad with terror, and Brenda lying dead of fright with her head hanging over the arm of the chair. I'll never get the sight of that room out of my mind, so long as I live. The facts, as you state them, are certainly most remarkable, said Holmes. I take it that you have no theory yourself which can in any way account for them. It's devilish, Mr. Holmes, devilish, cried Mortimer Tregenis. It is not of this world. Something has come into that room which has dashed the light of reason from their minds. What human contrivance could do that? I fear, said Holmes, that if the matter is beyond humanity it is certainly beyond me, yet we must exhaust all natural explanations before we fall back on such a theory as this. 
as to yourself mr tregenis i take it you were divided in some way from your family since they lived together and you had rooms apart that is so mr holmes though the matter is past and done with we were a family of tin miners at redruth but we sold our venture to a company and so retired with enough to keep us i won't deny that there was some feeling about the division of the money and it stood between us for a time but it was all forgiven and forgotten and we were the best of friends together looking back at the evening which you spent together does anything stand out in your memory as throwing any possible light upon the tragedy think carefully mr tregenis for any clue which can help me there's nothing at all sir your people were in their usual spirits never better were they nervous people did they ever show any apprehension of coming danger nothing of the kind you have nothing to add then which could assist me mortimer tregenis considered earnestly for a moment there is one thing occurs to me said he at last as we sat at the table my back was to the window and my brother george he being my partner at cards was facing it i saw him once look hard over my shoulder so i turned round and looked also the blind was up and the window shut but i could just make out the bushes on the lawn and it seemed to me for a moment that i saw something moving among them i couldn't even say if it was man or animal but i just thought there was something there when i asked him what he was looking at he told me that he had the same feeling that is all that i can say did you not investigate no the matter passed as unimportant you left them then without any premonition of evil none at all i am not clear how you came to hear the news so early this morning i am an early riser and generally take a walk before breakfast this morning i had hardly started when the doctor in his carriage overtook me he told me that old mrs porter had sent a boy down with an urgent message i sprang in beside him and we drove on when we got there we looked into that dreadful room the candles and the fire must have burned out hours before and they had been sitting there in the dark until dawn had broken the doctor said brenda must have been dead at least six hours there were no signs of violence she just lay across the arm of the chair with that look on her face george and owen were singing snatches of songs and gibbering like two great apes oh it was awful to see i couldn't stand it and the doctor was as white as a sheet indeed he fell into a chair in a sort of faint and we nearly had him on our hands as well remarkable most remarkable said holmes rising and taking his hat i think perhaps we had better go down to tredenic wartha without further delay i confess that i have seldom known a case which at first sight presented a more singular problem our proceedings of that first morning did little to advance the investigation it was marked however at the outset by an incident which left the most sinister impression upon my mind the approach to the spot at which the tragedy occurred is down a narrow winding country lane while we made our way along it we heard the rattle of a carriage coming towards us and stood aside to let it pass as it drove by us i caught a glimpse through the closed window of a horribly contorted grinning face glaring out at us those staring eyes and gnashing teeth flashed past us like a dreadful vision my brothers cried mortimer tregenis white to his lips they are taking them to helston we looked with horror after the black carriage lumbering upon its way then we turned our steps towards this ill-omened house in which they had met their strange fate it was a large and bright dwelling rather a villa than a cottage with a considerable garden which was already in that cornish air well filled with spring flowers towards this garden the window of the sitting-room fronted and from it according to mortimer tregenis must have come that thing of evil which had by sheer horror in a single instant blasted their minds holmes walked slowly and thoughtfully among the flower-plots and along the path before we entered the porch so absorbed was he in his thoughts i remember that he stumbled over the watering-pot upset its contents and deluged both our feet and the garden path inside the house we were met by the elderly cornish housekeeper mrs porter who with the aid of a young girl looked after the wants of the family she readily answered all holmes's questions she had heard nothing in the night her employers had all been in excellent spirits lately and she had never known them more cheerful and prosperous she had fainted with horror upon entering the room in the morning and seeing that dreadful company round the table 
She had, when she recovered, thrown open the window to let the morning air in, and had run down to the lane, whence she sent a farm lad for the doctor. The lady was on her bed upstairs if we cared to see her. It took four strong men to get the brothers into the asylum carriage. She would not herself stay in the house another day, and was starting that very afternoon to rejoin her family at St. Ives. We ascended the stairs and viewed the body. Miss Brenda Tregenis had been a very beautiful girl, though now verging upon middle age. Her dark, clear-cut face was handsome, even in death, but there still lingered upon it something of that convulsion of horror which had been her last human emotion. From her bedroom we descended to the sitting-room, where this strange tragedy had actually occurred. The charred ashes of the overnight fire lay in the grate. On the table were the four guttered and burned-out candles, with the cards scattered over its surface. The chairs had been moved back against the walls, but all else was as it had been the night before. Holmes paced with light, swift steps about the room. He sat in the various chairs, drawing them up and reconstructing their positions. He tested how much of the garden was visible. He examined the floor, the ceiling, and the fireplace. But never once did I see that sudden brightening of his eyes and tightening of his lips, which would have told me that he saw some gleam of light in this utter darkness. "'Why a fire?' he asked once. "'Had they always a fire in this small room on a spring evening?' Mortimer Tregenis explained that the night was cold and damp. For that reason, after his arrival, the fire was lit. "'What are you going to do now, Mr. Holmes?' he asked. My friend smiled and laid his hand upon my arm. "'I think, Watson, that I shall resume that course of tobacco poisoning which you have so often and so justly condemned,' said he. "'With your permission, gentlemen, we will now return to our cottage, for I am not aware that any new factor is likely to come to our notice here.' i will turn the facts over in my mind mr tregenis and should anything occur to me i will certainly communicate with you and the vicar in the meantime i wish you both good morning it was not until long after we were back in poldew cottage that holmes broke his complete and absorbed silence he sat coiled in his armchair, his haggard and ascetic face hardly visible amid the blue swell of his tobacco smoke his black brows drawn down his forehead contracted his eyes vacant and far away. Finally he laid down his pipe and sprang to his feet. "'It won't do, Watson,' said he, with a laugh. "'Let us walk along the cliffs together, and search for flint arrows. We are more likely to find them than clues to this problem. To let the brain work without sufficient material is like racing an engine. It racks itself to pieces. The sea air, sunshine, and patience, Watson. All else will come. Now, let us calmly define our position, Watson.' he continued, as we skirted the cliffs together. "'Let us get a firm grip on the very little which we do know, so that when fresh facts arise we may be ready to fit them into their places. I take it, in the first place, that neither of us is prepared to admit diabolical intrusions into the affairs of men. Let us begin by ruling that entirely out of our minds. Very good. There remain three persons who have been grievously stricken by some conscious or unconscious human agency. That is firm ground. Now, when did this occur?' Evidently, assuming his narrative to be true, it was immediately after Mr. Mortimer Tregenis had left the room. That is a very important point. The presumption is that it was within a few minutes afterwards. The cards still lay upon the table. It was already past their usual hour for bed, yet they had not changed their positions or pushed back their chairs. I repeat, then, that the occurrence was immediately after his departure, and not later than eleven o'clock last night." Our next obvious step is to check, so far as we can, the movements of Mr. Mortimer Tregenis after he left the room. In this there is no difficulty, and they seem to be above suspicion. Knowing my methods as you do, you were, of course, conscious of the somewhat clumsy water-pot expedient by which I obtained a clearer impress of his foot than might otherwise have been possible. The wet, sandy path took it admirably. Last night was also wet, you will remember, and it was not difficult, having obtained a sample print, to pick out his track among others and to follow his movements. He appears to have walked swiftly in the direction of the vicarage. If then Mortimer Tregenis disappeared from the scene, and yet some outside person affected the card-players, how can we reconstruct that person, and how was such an impression of horror conveyed? mrs porter may be eliminated she is evidently harmless is there any evidence that some one crept up to the garden window and in some manner produced so terrific an effect that he drove those who saw it out of their senses 
the only suggestion in this direction comes from mortimer tregenis himself who says that his brother spoke about some movement in the garden that is certainly remarkable as the night was rainy cloudy and dark any one who had the design to alarm these people would be compelled to place his very face against the glass before he could be seen there is a three-foot flower border outside this window but no indication of a footmark it is difficult to imagine then how an outsider could have made so terrible an impression upon the company nor have we found any possible motive for so strange and elaborate an attempt you perceive our difficulties watson they are only too clear i answered with conviction and yet with a little more material we may prove that they are not insurmountable said holmes i fancy that among your extensive archives watson you may find some which were nearly as obscure meanwhile we shall put the case aside until more accurate data are available and devote the rest of our morning to the pursuit of neolithic man i may have commented upon my friend's power of mental detachment but never have i wondered at it more than upon that spring morning in cornwall when for two hours he discoursed upon celts arrowheads and shards as lightly as if no sinister mystery were waiting for his solution it was not until we had returned in the afternoon to our cottage that we found a visitor awaiting us who soon brought our minds back to the matter in hand neither of us needed to be told who that visitor was the huge body the craggy and deeply seamed face with the fierce eyes and hawk-like nose the grizzled hair which nearly brushed our cottage ceiling, the beard, golden at the fringes and white near the lips, save for the nicotine stain from his perpetual cigar, all of these were as well known in London as in Africa, and could only be associated with the tremendous personality of Dr. Leon Sterndale, the great lion-hunter and explorer. We had heard of his presence in the district, and had once or twice caught sight of his tall figure upon the moorland paths. He made no advances to us, however, nor would we have dreamed of doing so to him, as it was well known that it was his love of seclusion which caused him to spend the greater part of the intervals between his journeys in a small bungalow buried in the lonely wood of Beauchamp Ariance. Here, amid his books and his maps, he lived an absolutely lonely life, attending to his own simple wants, and paying apparent little heed to the affairs of his neighbours. It was a surprise to me, therefore, to hear him asking Holmes, in an eager voice, whether he had made any advance in his reconstruction of this mysterious episode. "'The county police are utterly at fault,' said he. "'But perhaps your wider experience has suggested some conceivable explanation. My only claim to being taken into your confidence is that during my many residences here I have come to know this family of Trigenis very well. Indeed, upon my Cornish mother's side, I could call them cousins, and their strange fate has naturally been a great shock to me. I may tell you that I had got as far as Plymouth upon my way to Africa, but the news reached me this morning, and I came straight back again to help in the inquiry. Holmes raised his eyebrows. Did you lose your boat through it? I will take the next. Dear me, that is friendship indeed. I tell you they were relatives. Quite so, cousins of your mother. Was your baggage aboard the ship? Some of it, but the main part at the hotel. I see. But surely this event could not have found its way into the Plymouth morning papers. No, sir, I had a telegram. Might I ask from whom? A shadow passed over the gaunt face of the explorer. You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business. With an effort, Dr. Sterndale recovered his ruffled composure. I have no objection to telling you, he said. It was Mr. Roundhay, the vicar, who sent me the telegram which recalled me. Thank you, said Holmes. I may say, in answer to your original question, that I have not cleared my mind entirely on the subject of this case, but that I have every hope of reaching some conclusion. It would be premature to say more. Perhaps you would not mind telling me if your suspicions point in any particular direction. No, I can hardly answer that. Then I have wasted my time and need not prolong my visit. The famous doctor strode out of our cottage in considerable ill-humour, and within five minutes Holmes had followed him. I saw him no more until the evening, when he returned with a slow step and haggard face, which assured me that he had made no great progress with his investigation. He glanced at a telegram which awaited him, and threw it into the grate. "'From the Plymouth Hotel, Watson,' he said. 
I learned the name of it from the vicar, and I wired to make certain that Dr. Leon Sterndale's account was true. It appears he did indeed spend last night there, and that he has actually allowed some of his baggage to go on to Africa, while he returned to be present at this investigation. What do you make of that, Watson? He is deeply interested. Deeply interested, yes. There is a thread here which we have not yet grasped, and which may lead us through the tangle cheer up watson for i am very sure that our material has not yet all come to hand when it does we may soon leave our difficulties behind us little did i think how soon the words of holmes would be realized or how strange and sinister would be that new development which opened up an entirely fresh line of investigation end of section ten Section eleven of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section eleven The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Part two. I was shaving at my window in the morning when I heard the rattle of hoofs, and looking up saw a dog cart coming at a gallop down the road. It pulled up at our door, and our friend the vicar sprang from it and rushed up our garden path. Holmes was already dressed, and we hastened down to meet him. Our visitor was so excited that he could hardly articulate, but at last in gasps and bursts his tragic story came out of him. "'We are devil-ridden, Mr. Holmes! My poor parish is devil-ridden!' he cried. "'Satan himself is loose in it! We are given over into his hands!' He danced about in his agitation a ludicrous object if it were not for his ashy face and startled eyes. Finally he shot out his terrible news. Mr. Mortimer Tregenis died during the night, and with exactly the same symptoms as the rest of his family. Holmes sprang to his feet, all energy in an instant. Can you fit us both into your dog-cart? Yes, I can. Then, Watson, we will postpone our breakfast. Mr. Roundhay, we are entirely at your disposal. Hurry, hurry, before things get disarranged. The lodger occupied two rooms at the vicarage, which were in an angle by themselves, the one above the other. Below was a large sitting-room, above his bedroom. They looked out upon a croquet-lawn which came up to the windows. We had arrived before the doctor or the police, so that everything was absolutely undisturbed. Let me describe exactly the scene as we saw it upon that misty March morning. It has left an impression which can never be effaced from my mind. The atmosphere of the room was of a horrible and depressing stuffiness. The servant who had first entered had thrown up the window, or it would have been even more intolerable. This might partly be due to the fact that a lamp stood flaring and smoking on the centre table. Beside it sat the dead man, leaning back in his chair, his thin beard projecting, his spectacles pushed up on to his forehead, and his lean dark face turned towards the window, and twisted into the same distortion of terror which had marked the features of his dead sister. His limbs were convulsed, and his fingers contorted, as though he had died in a very paroxysm of fear. He was fully clothed, though there were signs that his dressing had been done in a hurry. We had already learned that his bed had been slept in, and that the tragic end had come to him in the early morning. One realised the red-hot energy which underlay Holmes's phlegmatic exterior, when one saw the sudden change which came over him from the moment that he entered the fatal apartment. In an instant he was tense and alert, his eyes shining, his face set, his limbs quivering with eager activity. He was out on the lawn in through the window, round the room, and up into the bedroom, for all the world like a dashing foxhound drawing a cover. In the bedroom he made a rapid cast around, and ended by throwing open the window, which appeared to give him some fresh cause for excitement, for he leaned out of it with loud ejaculations of interest and delight. Then he rushed down the stair, out through the open window, threw himself upon his face on the lawn, sprang up and into the room once more, all with the energy of the hunter who is at the very heels of his quarry. The lamp, which was an ordinary standard, he examined with minute care, making certain measurements upon its bowl. He carefully scrutinized with his lens the talc-shield which covered the top of the chimney, and scraped off some ashes which adhered to its upper surface, putting some of them into an envelope which he placed in his pocket-book. Finally, 
just as the doctor and the official police put in an appearance he beckoned to the vicar and we all three went out upon the lawn i'm glad to say that my investigation has not been entirely barren he remarked i cannot remain to discuss the matter with the police but i should be exceedingly obliged mr roundhay if you would give the inspector my compliments and direct his attention to the bedroom window and to the sitting-room lamp each is suggestive and together they are almost conclusive if the police would desire further information i shall be happy to see any of them at the cottage and now watson i think that perhaps we shall be better employed elsewhere it may be that the police resented the intrusion of an amateur or that they imagined themselves to be upon some hopeful line of investigation but it is certain that we heard nothing from them for the next two days during this time holmes spent some of his time smoking and dreaming in the cottage but a greater portion in country walks which he undertook alone returning after many hours without remark as to where he had been one experiment served to show me the line of his investigation he had bought a lamp which was the duplicate of the one which had burned in the room of mortimer tregenis on the morning of the tragedy this he filled with the same oil as that used at the vicarage and he carefully timed the period which it would take to be exhausted another experiment which he made was of a more unpleasant nature and one which i am not likely ever to forget you will remember watson he remarked one afternoon that there is a single common point of resemblance in the varying reports which have reached us this concerns the effect of the atmosphere of the room in each case upon those who had first entered it you will recollect that mortimer tregenis in describing the episode of his last visit to his brother's house remarked that the doctor on entering the room fell into a chair you had forgotten well i can answer for it that it was so now you will remember also that mrs porter the housekeeper told us that she herself fainted upon entering the room and had afterwards opened the window in the second case that of mortimer tregenis himself you cannot have forgotten the horrible stuffiness of that room when we arrived though the servant had thrown open the window that servant i found upon inquiry was so ill that she had gone to her bed you will admit watson that these facts are very suggestive in each case there is evidence of a poisonous atmosphere in each case also there is combustion going on in the room in one case a fire in the other a lamp the fire was needed but the lamp was lit as a comparison of the oil consumed will show long after it was broad daylight why surely because there is some connection between three things the burning the stuffy atmosphere and finally the madness or death of those unfortunate people that is clear is it not it would appear so at least we may accept it as a working hypothesis we will suppose then that something was burned in each case which produced an atmosphere causing strange toxic effects very good in the first instance that of the tregenis family this substance was placed in the fire now the window was shut but the fire would naturally carry fumes to some extent up the chimney hence one would expect the effects of the poison to be less than in the second case where there was less escape for the vapour the result seems to indicate that it was so since in the first case only the woman who had presumably the more sensitive organism was killed the others exhibiting that temporary or permanent lunacy which is evidently the first effect of the drug in the second case the result was complete the facts therefore seem to bear out the theory of a poison which worked by combustion with this train of reasoning in my head i naturally looked about in mortimer tregenis room to find some remains of this substance the obvious place to look was the talc shelf or smoke guard of the lamp there sure enough i perceived a number of flaky ashes and round the edges a fringe of brownish powder which had not yet been consumed half of this i took as you saw and i placed it in an envelope why half holmes it is not for me my dear watson to stand in the way of the official police force i leave them all the evidence which i found the poison still remained upon the talc had they the wit to find it now watson we will light our lamp we will however take the precaution to open our window to avoid the premature decease of two deserving members of society and you will seat yourself near that open window in an armchair unless like a sensible man you determine to have nothing to do with the affair oh you will see it out will you i thought i knew my watson this chair i will place opposite yours so that we may be the same distance from the poison and face to face the door we will leave ajar each is now in a position to watch the other and to bring the experiment to an end should the symptoms seem alarming is that all clear 
well then i take our powder or what remains of it from the envelope and i lay it above the burning lamp so now watson let us sit down and await developments they were not long in coming i had hardly settled in my chair before i was conscious of a thick musky odour subtle and nauseous at the very first whiff of it my brain and my imagination were beyond all control a thick black cloud swelled before my eyes and my mind told me that in this cloud unseen as yet but about to spring out upon my appalled senses lurked all that was vaguely horrible all that was monstrous and inconceivably wicked in the universe vague shapes swirled and swam amid the dark cloud-bank each a menace and a warning of something coming the advent of some unspeakable dweller upon the threshold whose very shadow would blast my soul a freezing horror took possession of me i felt that my hair was rising that my eyes were protruding that my mouth was opened and my tongue like leather the turmoil within my brain was such that something must surely snap i tried to scream and was vaguely aware of some hoarse croak which was my own voice but distant and detached from myself at the same moment in some effort of escape i broke through that cloud of despair and had a glimpse of holmes's face white rigid and drawn with horror the very look which i had seen upon the features of the dead it was that vision which gave me an instant of sanity and of strength i dashed from my chair threw my arms round holmes and together we lurched through the door and an instant afterwards had thrown ourselves down upon the grass plot and were lying side by side conscious only of the glorious sunshine which was bursting its way through the hellish cloud of terror which had girt us in slowly it rose from our souls like the mists from a landscape until peace and reason had returned and we were sitting upon the grass wiping our clammy foreheads and looking with apprehension at each other to mark the last traces of that terrific experience which we had undergone upon my word watson said holmes at last with an unsteady voice i owe you both my thanks and an apology it was an unjustifiable experiment even for one's self and doubly so for a friend i am really very sorry you know i answered with some emotion for i have never seen so much of holmes's heart before that it is my greatest joy and privilege to help you he relapsed at once into the half humorous half cynical vein which was his habitual attitude to those about him it would be superfluous to drive us mad my dear watson said he a candid observer would certainly declare that we were so already before we embarked upon so wild an experiment i confess that i never imagined that the effect could be so sudden and so severe he dashed into the cottage and reappearing with the burning lamp held at full arm's length he threw it among a bank of brambles we must give the room a little time to clear i take it watson that you have no longer a shadow of a doubt as to how these tragedies were produced none whatever but the cause remains as obscure as before come into the arbour here and let us discuss it together that villainous stuff seems still to linger round my throat i think we must admit that all the evidence points to this man mortimer tregenis having been the criminal in the first tragedy though he was the victim in the second one we must remember in the first place that there is some story of a family quarrel followed by a reconciliation how bitter that quarrel may have been or how hollow the reconciliation we cannot tell when i think of mortimer tregenis with the foxy face and the small shrewd beady eyes behind the spectacles he is not a man whom i should judge to be of a particularly forgiving disposition well in the next place you will remember that this idea of some one moving in the garden which took our attention for a moment from the real cause of the tragedy emanated from him he had a motive in misleading us finally if he did not throw the substance into the fire at the moment of leaving the room who did do so the affair happened immediately after his departure had any one else come in the family would certainly have risen from the table besides in peaceful cornwall visitors did not arrive after ten o'clock at night we may take it then that all the evidence points to mortimer tregenis as the culprit then his own death was suicide 
"'Well, Watson, it is on the face of it not an impossible supposition. The man who had the guilt upon his soul of having brought such a fate upon his own family might well be driven by remorse to inflict it upon himself. There are, however, some cogent reasons against it. Fortunately, there is one man in England who knows all about it, and I have made arrangements by which we shall hear the facts this afternoon from his own lips. Ah, he is a little before his time. Perhaps you would kindly step this way, Dr. Leon Sterndale. We have been conducting a chemical experiment indoors which has left our little room hardly fit for the reception of so distinguished a visitor. I had heard the click of the garden gate, and now the majestic figure of the great African explorer appeared upon the path. He turned in some surprise towards the rustic arbour in which we sat. You sent for me, Mr. Holmes. I had your note about an hour ago, and I have come though I really do not know why I should obey your summons. "'Perhaps we can clear the point up before we separate,' said Holmes. "'Meanwhile, I am much obliged to you for your courteous acquiescence. You will excuse this informal reception in the open air, but my friend Watson and I have nearly furnished an additional chapter to what the papers call the Cornish Horror, and we prefer a clear atmosphere for the present. Perhaps, since the matters which we have to discuss will affect you personally in a very intimate fashion, it is as well that we should talk where there can be no eavesdropping." The explorer took his cigar from his lips and gazed sternly at my companion. "'I am at a loss to know, sir,' he said, "'what you can have to speak about, which affects me personally in a very intimate fashion.' "'The killing of Mortimer Tregenis, said Holmes. For a moment I wished that I were armed. Sterndale's fierce face turned to a dusky red, his eyes glared, and the knotted, passionate veins started out in his forehead, while he sprang forward with clenched hands towards my companion. Then he stopped, and with a violent effort he resumed a cold, rigid calmness, which was, perhaps, more suggestive of danger than his hot-headed outburst. "'I have lived so long among savages and beyond the law,' said he, "'that I have gotten to the way of being a law to myself. You would do well, Mr. Holmes, not to forget it, for I have no desire to do you an injury. Nor have I any desire to do you an injury, Dr. Sterndale. Surely the clearest proof of it is that, knowing what I know, I have sent for you and not for the police. Sterndale sat down with a gasp, overawed for perhaps the first time in his adventurous life. There was a calm assurance of power in Holmes's manner which could not be withstood. Our visitor stammered for a moment, his great hands opening and shutting in his agitation. "'What do you mean?' he asked at last. "'If this is a bluff upon your part, Mr. Holmes, you have chosen a bad man for your experiment. Let us have no more beating about the bush. What do you mean?' "'I will tell you,' said Holmes. "'And the reason why I tell you is that I hope frankness may beget frankness. What my next step may be will depend entirely upon the nature of your own defence. My defence? Yes, sir. My defence against what? Against the charge of killing Mortimer Tregenis. Sterndale mopped his forehead with his handkerchief. Upon my word, you are getting on, said he. Do all your successes depend on this prodigious power of bluff? The bluff, said Holmes sternly, is upon your side, Dr. Leon Sterndale, and not upon mine. As a proof, I will tell you some of the facts upon which my conclusions are based of your return from plymouth allowing much of your property to go on to africa i will say nothing save that it first informed me that you were one of the factors which had to be taken into account in reconstructing this drama i came back i have heard your reasons and regard them as unconvincing and inadequate we will pass that you came down here to ask me whom i suspected i refused to answer you you then went to the vicarage waited outside it for some time and finally returned to your cottage how do you know that i followed you i saw no one that is what you may expect to see when i follow you you spent a restless night at your cottage and you formed certain plans which in the early morning you proceeded to put into execution leaving your door just as day was breaking you filled your pocket with some reddish gravel that was lying heaped beside your gate sterndale gave a violent start and looked at holmes in amazement you then walked swiftly for the mile which separated you from the vicarage. You were wearing, I may remark, the same pair of ribbed tennis shoes which are at the present moment upon your feet. At the vicarage you passed through the orchard and the side hedge, coming out under the window of the lodger Tregenis. 
it was now daylight but the household was not yet stirring you drew some of the gravel from your pocket and you threw it up at the window above you sterndale sprang to his feet i believe you are the devil himself he cried holmes smiled at the compliment it took two or possibly three handfuls before the lodger came to the window you beckoned him to come down he dressed hurriedly and descended to his sitting-room you entered by the window there was an interview a short one during which you walked up and down the room then you passed out and closed the window standing on the lawn outside smoking a cigar and watching what occurred finally after the death of tregenis you withdrew as you had come now dr sterndale how do you justify such conduct and what were the motives for your actions if you prevaricate or trifle with me i give you my assurance that the matter will pass out of my hands for ever our visitor's face had turned ashen grey as he listened to the words of his accuser now he sat for some time in thought with his face sunk in his hands then with a sudden impulsive gesture he plucked a photograph from his breast pocket and threw it on the rustic table before us. "'That is why I've done it,' said he. It showed the bust and face of a very beautiful woman. Holmes stooped over it. "'Brenda Tregenis, said he. "'Yes, Brenda Tregenis," repeated our visitor. "'For years I have loved her. For years she has loved me. There is the secret of that Cornish seclusion which people have marvelled at. It has brought me close to the one thing on earth that was dear to me. I could not marry her, for I have a wife who has left me for years, and yet whom, by the deplorable laws of England, I could not divorce. For years Brenda waited, for years I waited. And this is what we have waited for." A terrible sob shook his great frame, and he clutched his throat under his brindled beard. Then, with an effort, he mastered himself and spoke on. The vicar knew he was in our confidence. He would tell you that she was an angel upon earth. That was why he telegraphed to me and I returned. What was my baggage or Africa to me when I learned that such a fate had come to my darling? There you have the missing clue to my action, Mr. Holmes. Proceed, said my friend. Dr. Sterndale drew from his pocket a paper packet and laid it upon the table. On the outside was written, Radix Pedis Diaboli with a red poison label beneath it. He pushed it towards me. I understand that you are a doctor, sir. Have you ever heard of this preparation? Devil's foot root? No, I have never heard of it. It is no reflection upon your professional knowledge, said he, for I believe that, save for one sample in a laboratory in Buddha, there is no other specimen in Europe. It has not yet found its way either into the pharmacopoeia or into the literature of toxicology. The root is shaped like a foot, half human, half goat-like, hence the fanciful name given by a botanical missionary. It is used as an ordeal poison by the medicine men in certain districts of West Africa, and it is kept as a secret among them. This particular specimen I obtained under very extraordinary circumstances in the Ubangi country. He opened the paper as he spoke, and disclosed a heap of reddish-brown snuff-like powder. "'Well, sir?' asked Holmes sternly. "'I'm about to tell you, Mr. Holmes, all that actually occurred. For you already know so much that it is clearly to my interest that you should know all. I have already explained the relationship in which I stood to the Trajanus family. For the sake of the sister, I was friendly with the brothers. There was a family quarrel about money, which estranged this man Mortimer, but he was supposed to be made up, and I, afterwards, met with him as I did the others. He was a sly, subtle, scheming man, and several things arose which gave me a suspicion of him, but I had no cause for any positive quarrel. One day, only a couple of weeks ago, he came down to my cottage and I showed him some of my African curiosities. Among other things, I exhibited this powder and I told him of its strange properties, how it stimulates those brain centers which control the emotion of fear, and how either madness or death is the fate of the unhappy native who is subjected to the ordeal by the priest of his tribe. I told him how powerless European science would be to detect it. How he took it I cannot say, for I never left the room, but there is no doubt that it was then, while I was opening cabinets and stooping to boxes, that he managed to abstract some of the devil's foot root. 
I well remember how he plied me with questions as to the amount and the time that was needed for its effect, but I had little dreamed that he could have a personal reason for asking. I thought no more of the matter until the vicar's telegram reached me at Plymouth. This villain had thought that I would be at sea before the news could reach me, that I should be lost for years in Africa. But I returned at once. Of course, I could not listen to the details without feeling assured that my poison had been used. I came round to see you on the chance that some other explanation had suggested itself to you. But there could be none. I was convinced that Mortimer Trigenis was the murderer, that for the sake of money, and with the idea, perhaps, that if other members of his family were all insane, he would be the sole guardian of their joint property. He had used the devil's foot powder upon them, driven two of them out of their senses, and killed his sister. Brenda, the one human being whom I ever loved, or has ever loved me, there was his crime. What was to be his punishment? Should I appeal to the law? Where were my proofs? I knew the facts were true, but could I help to make a jury of countrymen believe so fantastic a story? I might, or I might not, but I could not afford to fail. My soul cried for revenge. I have said to you once before, Mr. Holmes, that I have spent much of my life outside the law, and that I have come at last to be a law to myself. So it was even now. I determined that the fate which he had given to others should be shared by himself. Either that, or I would do justice upon him with my own hand. In all England there can be no man who sets less value upon his own life than I do at the present moment. Now I have told you all. You have yourself supplied the rest. I did as you say. After a restless night, set off early from my cottage. I foresaw the difficulty of arousing him, so I gathered some gravel from the pile which you had mentioned, and I used it to throw up to his window. He came down and admitted me through the window of the sitting-room. I laid his offense before him. I told him that I had come both as judge and executioner. The wretch sank into a chair, paralyzed at the sight of my revolver. I lit the lamp, put the powder above it, and stood outside the window ready to carry out my threat to shoot him should he try to leave the room. In five minutes he died. My God, how he died! But my heart was flint, for he endured nothing which my innocent darling had not felt before him. There is my story, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps if you loved a woman, you would have done as much yourself. At any rate, I am in your hands. You can take what steps you like. As I have said, there is no man living who can fear death less than I do. Holmes sat for some little time in silence. "'What were your plans?' he asked at last. "'I had intended to bury myself in Central Africa. My work there is but half finished.' "'Go and do the other half,' said Holmes. "'I at least am not prepared to prevent you.' Dr. Sterndale raised his giant figure, bowed gravely, and walked from the arbour. Holmes lit his pipe and handed me his pouch. "'Some fumes which are not poisonous would be a welcome change,' said he. "'I think you must agree, Watson, that it is not a case in which we are called upon to interfere. Our investigation has been independent, and our action shall be so also. You would not denounce the man?' "'Certainly not,' I answered. "'I have never loved, Watson, but if I did, and the woman I loved had met such an end, I might act even as our lawless lion-hunter has done. Who knows?' "'Well, Watson, I will not offend your intelligence by explaining what is obvious. The gravel upon the window-sill was, of course, the starting-point of my research. It was unlike anything in the vicarage garden. Only when my attention had been drawn to Dr. Sterndale and his cottage did I find its counterpart. The lamp shining in broad daylight, and the remains of the powder upon the shield, were successive links in a fairly obvious chain. And now, my dear Watson, I think we may dismiss the matter from our mind, and go back with a clear conscience to the study of those Chaldean roots, which are surely to be traced in the Cornish branch of the great Celtic speech. End of section 11 His Last Bow, Section 12. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Section 12. His Last Bow. Narrator read by Shakira Searle. Dr. Watson read by Corrie Samuel. Sherlock Holmes read by Beth Thomas. Mr. Von Bork, read by James Callahan. 
Baron von Herling Read by Julia Niedermeyer Mr. Altamont of Chicago Read by Beth Thomas Martha Read by P. J. Morgan It was nine o'clock at night upon the second of August, the most terrible August in the history of the world. One might have thought already that God's curse hung heavy over a degenerate world, for there was an awesome hush and a feeling of vague expectancy in the sultry and stagnant air. The sun had long set, but one blood-red gash, like an open wound, lay low in the distant west. Above, the stars were shining brightly, and below, the lights of the shipping glimmered in the bay. The two famous Germans stood beside the stone parapet of the garden walk, with the long, low, heavily gabled house behind them, and they looked down upon the broad sweep of the beach at the foot of the great chalk cliff in which von Bork, like some wandering eagle, had perched himself four years before. They stood with their heads close together, talking in low confidential tones. From below, the two glowing ends of their cigars might have been the smouldering eyes of some malignant fiend looking down in the darkness. A remarkable man, this von Bork, a man who could hardly be matched among all the devoted agents of the Kaiser. It was his talents which had first recommended him for the English mission, the most important mission of all. But since he had taken it over, those talents had become more and more manifest to the half-dozen people in the world who were really in touch with the truth. One of these was his present companion, Baron von Herling, the chief secretary of the legation, whose huge hundred-horsepower Ben's car was blocking the country lane as it waited to waft its owner back to London. So far, as I can judge the trend of events, you will probably be back in Berlin within the week, the secretary was saying. When you get there, my dear von Borg, I think you will be surprised at the welcome you will receive. I happen to know what is thought of in the highest quarters of your work in this country. He was a huge man, the secretary, deep, broad, and tall, with a slow, heavy fashion of speech, which had been his main asset in his political career. Von Bork laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, they are not very hard to deceive, he remarked. A more docile, simple folk could not be imagined. I don't know about that, said the other thoughtfully. They have strange limits, and one must learn to observe them. It is the surface simplicity of theirs which makes a trap for the stranger. One's first impression is that they are entirely soft. Then one comes suddenly upon something very hard, and you know that you have reached the limit and must adapt yourself to the fact. They have, for example, the insular conventions which simply must be observed. Meaning good form and that sort of thing? Von Bork sighed as one who had suffered much. Meaning British prejudice in all its queer manifestations. As an example, I may quote one of my own worst blunders. I can afford to talk of my blunders, for you know my work well enough to be aware of my successes. It was on my first arrival. I was invited to a weekend gathering at the country house of a cabinet minister. The conversation was amazingly indiscreet. Von Bork nodded. I've been there, said he, dryly. Exactly. Well, I naturally sent a resume of the information to Berlin. Unfortunately, our good Chancellor is a little heavy-handed in these matters, and he transmitted a remark 
which showed that he was aware of what had been said. This, of course, took the trail straight up to me. You have no idea the harm that it did me. There was nothing soft about our British hosts on that occasion, I can assure you. I was two years living it down. Now you, with this sporting pose of yours. No, no, don't call it a pose. A pose is an artificial thing. This is quite natural. I am a born sportsman. I enjoy it. Well, that makes it the more effective. You yacht against them. You hunt with them. You play polo. You match them in every game. Your four in hand takes the prizes at Olympia. I have even heard that you go to the length of boxing with the young officers. What is the result? Nobody takes you seriously. You are a good old sport, quite a decent fellow for a German, a hard-drinking, nightclub, knockabout town, devil-may-care young fellow. And all the time this quiet country house of yours is the centre of half the mischief in England, and the sporting squire the most astute secret service man in Europe. Genius, my dear von Borg, genius. You flatter me, Baron, but certainly I may claim my four years in this country have not been unproductive. I've never shown you my little store. Would you mind stepping in for a moment? The door of the study opened straight onto the terrace. Von Bork pushed it back, and, leading the way, he clicked the switch of the electric light. He then closed the door behind the bulky form which followed him, and carefully adjusted the heavy curtain over the latticed window. Only when all these precautions had been taken and tested did he turn his sunburned, aquiline face to his guest. Some of my papers have gone said he. When my wife and the household left yesterday for flushing, they took the less important with them. I must, of course, claim the protection of the embassy for the others. Your name has already been filed as one of the personal suit. There will be no difficulties for you or your baggage. Of course, it is just possible that we may not have to go. England may leave France to her fate. We are sure that there is no binding treaty between them. And Belgium? Yes, and Belgium too. Von Bork shook his head. I don't see how that could be. There is a definite treaty there. She could never recover from such a humiliation. She would at least have peace for the moment. But her honour? Tut, my dear sir, we live in a utilitarian age. Honour is a medieval conception. Besides, England is not ready. It is an inconceivable thing, but even our special war tax of fifty million, which one would think made our purpose as clear as if we had advertised it on the front page of the Times, has not roused these people from their slumbers. Here and there one hears a question. It is my business to find an answer. Here and there also there is an irritation. It is my business to soothe it. But I can assure you that, so far as the essentials go, the storage of munitions, the preparation for submarine attack, the arrangements for making high explosives, nothing is prepared. How, then, can England come in, especially when we have stirred her up such a devil's brew of Irish civil war, window-breaking furies, and God knows what, to keep her thoughts at home. She must think of her future. Ah, that is another matter. I fancy that in the future we have our own very definite plans about England, and that your information will be very vital to us. It is today or tomorrow with Mr. John Bull. If he prefers today, we are perfectly ready. If it is tomorrow, we shall be more ready still. I should think they would be wiser to fight with allies than without them, but that is their own affair. This week is their week of destiny. But you were speaking of her papers? He sat in the armchair, with the light shining upon his broad, bald head, while he puffed sedately at his cigar. 
the large oak-panelled book-lined room had a curtain hung in the further corner when this was drawn it disclosed a large brass-bound safe von bork detached a small key from his watch-chain and after some considerable manipulation of the lock he swung open the heavy door look said he standing clear with a wave of his hand the light shone vividly into the opened safe and the secretary of the embassy gazed with an absorbed interest at the rows of stuffed pigeonholes with which it was furnished each pigeonhole had its label and his eyes as he glanced along them read a long series of such titles as fords harbour defences aeroplanes ireland egypt portsmouth forts the channel rasyth and a score of others each compartment was bristling with papers and plans colossal said the secretary putting down his cigar he softly clapped his fat hands and all in four years baron not such a bad show as a hard drinking hard riding country squire but the gem of my collection is coming and there is a setting all ready for it he pointed to a space over which naval signals was printed but you have a good dossier there already ach out of date and waste paper the admiralty in some way got the alarm and every code has been changed it was a blow baron the worst setback in my whole campaign but thanks to my cheque-book and the good ultimate all will be well to-night the baron looked at his watch and gave a guttural exclamation of disappointment well i really can wait no longer you can imagine that things are moving at present in carlton terrace and that we have all to be at our posts i had hoped to be able to bring news of your great coup did altamont name no hour von bork pushed over a telegram we'll come without fail to-night and bring new sparking plugs altamont sparking plugs eh you see he poses as a motor expert and i keep a full garage in our code everything likely to come up is named after some spare part if he talks of a radiator it is a battleship of an oil pump a cruiser and so on sparking plugs are naval signals from portsmouth at midday said the secretary examining the superscription by the way what do you give him five hundred pounds for this particular job of course he has a salary as well the greedy rogue they are useful these traitors but i grudge them their blood money i grudge altamont nothing he is a wonderful worker if i pay him well at least he delivers the goods to use his own phrase besides he is not a traitor i assure you that our most pan-germanic junker is a sucking dove in his feelings towards england as compared with a real bitter irish-american oh an irish-american if you heard him talk you would not doubt it sometimes i assure you i can hardly understand him he seems to have declared war on the king's english as well as on the english king must you really go he may be here any moment no i'm sorry but i have already overstayed my time we shall expect you early to-morrow and when you get that signal book through the little door on the duke of york's steps you can put a triumphant fini to your record in england what to k he indicated a heavily sealed dust-covered bottle which stood with two high glasses upon a salver may i offer you a glass before your journey no thanks but it looks like revelry altamont has a nice taste in vines and he took a fancy to my toquet he is a touchy fellow and needs humouring in small things i have to study him i assure you they had strolled out on to the terrace again and along it to the further end where at a touch from the baron's chauffeur the great car shivered and chuckled those are the lights of harwich i suppose said the secretary pulling on his dust coat how still and peaceful it all seems there may be other lights within the week and the english coast a less tranquil place the heavens too may not be quite so peaceful 
if all that the good Zeppelin promises us comes true. By the way, who is that? Only one window showed a light behind them. In it there stood a lamp, and beside it, seated at a table, was a dear old ruddy-faced woman in a country cap. She was bending over her knitting, and stopping occasionally to stroke a large black cat upon a stool beside her. That is Marta, the only servant I have left. The secretary chuckled. She might almost personify Britannia, said he, with her complete self-absorption and general air of comfortable somnolence. Well, au revoir, von Borg. With a final wave of his hand, he sprang into the car, and a moment later the two golden cones from the headlights shot through the darkness. The secretary lay back in the cushions of the luxurious limousine, with his thoughts so full of the impending European tragedy that he hardly observed that as his car swung round the village street it nearly passed over a little ford, coming in the opposite direction. Von Bork walked slowly back to the study when the last gleams of the motor lamps had faded into the distance. As he passed, he observed that his old housekeeper had put out her lamp and retired. It was a new experience to him, the silence and darkness of his widespread house, for his family and household had been a large one. It was a relief to him, however, to think that they were all in safety, and that, but for that one old woman who had lingered in the kitchen, he had the whole place to himself. There was a good deal of tidying up to do inside his study, and he set himself to do it, until his keen, handsome face was flushed with the heat of the burning papers. A leather valise stood beside his table, and into this he began to pack very neatly and systematically the precious contents of his safe. He had hardly got started with the work, however, when his quick ears caught the sounds of a distant car. Instantly he gave an exclamation of satisfaction, strapped up the valise, shut the safe, locked it, and hurried out on to the terrace. He was just in time to see the lights of a small car come to a halt at the gate. A passenger sprang out of it, and advanced swiftly towards him, while the chauffeur, a heavily built, elderly man with a grey moustache, settled down like one who resigns himself to a long vigil. Well? asked von Bork eagerly, running forth to meet his visitor. For answer, the man waved a small brown paper parcel triumphantly above his head. You can give me the glad hand tonight, mister, he cried. I'm bringing home the bacon at last. The signals? Same as I said in my cable. Every last one of them. Semaphore, lamp code, Marconi. A copy, mind you, not the original. That was too dangerous. But it's the real goods, and you can later that. He slapped the German upon the shoulder, with a rough familiarity, from which the other winced. Come in, he said. I am all alone in the house. I was only waiting for this. Of course, a copy is better than the original. If an original was missing, they would change the whole thing. You think it's all safe about the copy? The Irish-American had entered the study, and stretched his long limbs from the armchair. He was a tall, gaunt man of sixty, with clear-cut features and a small goatee beard, which gave him a general resemblance to the caricatures of Uncle Sam. A half-smoked, sodden cigar hung from the corner of his mouth, and as he sat down, he struck a match and relit it. Make him ready for a move, he remarked as he looked round him. Say, mister, he added, as his eyes fell upon the safe from which the curtain was now removed. You don't tell me you keep your papers in that. Why not? Gosh, in a wide-open contraption like that, and they reckon you to be some spy, why, a Yankee crook would be into that with can-opener. If I'd known any letter of mine was going to lie loose in a thing like that, I'd have been a mug to write to you at all. It would puzzle any crook to force that safe, von Bork answered. 
You have only cut that metal with any tool. But the lock? No, it's a double combination lock. You know what that is? Search me, said the American. Well, you need a word as well as a set of figures before you can get the lock to work. He rose and showed a double radiating disc round the keyhole. This outer one is for the letters, the inner one for the figures. Well, well, that's fine. So it's not quite as simple as you thought. It was four years ago that I had it made, and what do you think I chose for the word and figures? It's beyond me. Well, I chose August for the word and 1914 for the figures, and here we are. The American's face showed his surprise and admiration. My, but that was smart. You have it down to a fine thing. Yes, a few of us even then could have guessed the date. Here it is, and I'm shutting down tomorrow morning. Well, I guess you'll have to fix me up also. I'm not staying in this gall down country all my lonesome. In a week or less, from what I see, John Bull will be on his hind legs and fair rampant. I'd rather watch him from over the water. But you're an American citizen. Well, so was Jack James, an American citizen, but he's doing time in Portland all the same. It cuts no ice with a British copper to tell him you're an American citizen. It's British law and order over here, says he. By the way, mister, talking of Jack James, it seems to me you don't do much to cover your men. What do you mean? Von Bork asked sharply. Well, you are their employer, ain't you? It's up to you to see they don't fall down, but they do fall down, and when did you ever pick them up? There's James. It was James's own fault. You know that yourself. He was too self-willed for the job. James was a bonehead, I'll give you that. Then there was Harless. The man was mad. Well, he went a bit woozy toward the end. It's enough to make a man bug house when he has to play a part from morning to night with a hundred guys all ready to set the coppers wise to him. But now there's Steiner. Von Bork started violently, and his ruddy face turned a shade paler. What about Steiner? Well, they've got him, that's all. They raided his store last night, and he and his papers are all in the Portsmouth jail. You'll go off and he, poor devil, will have to stand the racket, and lucky if he gets off with his life. That's why I want to get over the water as soon as you do. Von Bork was a strong, self-contained man, but it was easy to see that the news had shaken him. How could they have got on to Steiner? He muttered. That's the worst blow yet. Well, you nearly had a worse one, for I believe they're not far off me. You don't mean that. Sure thing. My landlady down Fratton Way had some inquiries, and when I heard of it, I guessed it was time for me to hustle. But what I want to know, mister, is how the coppers know these things. Steiner is the fifth man you've lost since I signed on with you, and I know the name of the sixth if I don't get a move on. How do you explain it, and ain't you ashamed to see your men go down like this? Von Bork flushed crimson. How dare you speak in such a way? If I didn't dare things, mister, I wouldn't be in your service. But I'll tell you straight what's in my mind. I've heard that with you German politicians, when an agent has done his work, you are not sorry to see him put away. Von Bork sprang to his feet. Do you dare to suggest that I have given away my own agents? I don't stand for that, mister. But there's a stool pigeon or a cross somewhere, and it's up to you to find out where it is. Anyhow, I'm taking no more chances. It's me for Little Holland, and the sooner the better. Von Bork had mastered his anger. We have been allies too long to quarrel now at the very hour of victory, he said. You have done splendid work and taken risks, and I can't forget it. By all means, go to Holland, and then you can get a boat from Rotterdam to New York. No other line will be safe a week from now. I'll take that book and pack it with the rest. The American held the small parcel in his hand, but made no motion to give it up. What about the dough? he asked. The what? The boodle, the reward, the five hundred pounds. The gunner turned damn nasty at the last, and I had to square him with an extra hundred dollars, or it would have been Nitsky for you and me. Nothing doing, says he, and he meant it, too. But the last hundred did it. It's cost me two hundred pounds from first to last, so it isn't likely I'd give it up without getting my wad. Von Bork smiled with some bitterness. You don't seem to have a very high opinion of my honour, said he. You want some money before you give up the book. Well, mister, it is a business proposition. All right, have it your way. He sat down at the table and scribbled a check, which he tore from the book, but he refrained from handing it to his companion. 
after all, since we are to be on such terms, Mr. Altamont, said he. I don't see why I should trust you any more than you trust me. Do you understand? He added, looking back over his shoulder at the American. There's a check upon the table. I claim the right to examine that parcel before you pick the money up. The American passed it over without a word. Von Bork undid a winding of string and two wrappers of paper. Then he sat gazing for a moment in silent amazement at a small blue book which lay before him. Across the cover was printed in golden letters, Practical Handbook of Bee Culture. Only for one instant did the master spy glare at this strangely irrelevant inscription. The next he was gripped at the back of his neck by a grasp of iron, and a chloroformed sponge was held in front of his writhing face. "'Another glass, Watson,' said Mr. Sherlock Holmes, as he extended the bottle of Imperial Tokay. The thick-set chauffeur, who had seated himself by the table, pushed forward his glass with some eagerness. "'It is good wine, Holmes.' "'A remarkable wine, Watson.' our friend upon the sofa has assured me that it is from franz joseph's special cellar at the schoenbrunn palace might i trouble you to open the window for chloroform vapour does not help the palate the safe was ajar and holmes standing in front of it was removing dossier after dossier swiftly examining each and then packing it neatly in von bork's valise the german lay upon the sofa sleeping stertorously with a strap round his upper arms, and another round his legs. "'We need not hurry ourselves, Watson. We are safe from interruption. Would you mind touching the bell? There is no one in the house except old Martha, who has played her part to admiration. I got her the situation here when first I took the matter up. Ah, Martha, you will be glad to hear that all is well.' The pleasant old lady had appeared in the doorway. She curtsied with a smile to Mr. Holmes, but glanced with some apprehension at the figure upon the sofa. "'It is all right, Martha. He has not been hurt at all.' "'I am glad of that, Mr. Holmes. According to his lights he has been a kind master. He wanted me to go with his wife to Germany yesterday, but that would hardly have suited your plans, would it, sir?' "'No, indeed, Martha. So long as you were here I was easy in my mind.' We waited some time for your signal tonight. It was the secretary, sir. I know, his car passed ours. I thought he would never go. I knew that it would not suit your plan, sir, to find him here. No, indeed. Well, it only meant that we waited half an hour or so until I saw your lamp go out and knew that the coast was clear. You can report to me tomorrow in London, Martha, at Claridge's Hotel. Very good, sir. I suppose you have everything ready to leave? Yes, sir. He posted seven letters today. I have the addresses as usual. Very good, Martha. I will look into them tomorrow. Good night. These papers, he continued, as the old lady vanished, are not of very great importance, for, of course, the information which they represent has been sent off long ago to the German government. These are the originals which could not safely be got out of the country. Then they are of no use. I should not go so far as to say that, Watson. They will at least show our people what is known and what is not. I may say that a good many of these papers have come through me, and I need not add a thoroughly untrustworthy. It would brighten my declining years to see a German cruiser navigating the Solent according to the minefield plans which I have furnished. But you, Watson— He stopped his work and took his old friend by the shoulders. "'I've hardly seen you in the light yet. How have the years used you? You look the same blithe boy as ever.' "'I feel twenty years younger, Holmes. I have seldom felt so happy as when I got your wire, asking me to meet you at Harwich with the car. But you, Holmes, you have changed very little, save for that horrible goatee.' "'These are the sacrifices one makes for one's country, Watson,' said Holmes pulling at his little tuft. 
to-morrow it will be but a dreadful memory with my hair cut and a few other superficial changes i shall no doubt reappear at claridge's to-morrow as i was before this american stunt i beg your pardon watson my well of english seems to be permanently defiled before this american job came my way but you have retired holmes we heard of you as living the life of a hermit among your bees and your books in a small farm upon the south downs exactly watson here is the fruit of my leisured ease the magnum opus of my latter years he picked up the volume from the table and read out the whole title practical handbook of bee culture with some observations upon the segregation of the queen alone i did it behold the fruit of pensive nights and laborious days when i watched the little working gangs as i once watched the criminal world of london but how did you get to work again ah i have often marvelled at it myself the foreign minister alone i could have withstood but when the premier also deigned to visit my humble roof the fact is watson that this gentleman upon the sofa was a bit too good for our people he was in a class by himself things were going wrong and no one could understand why they were going wrong agents were suspected or even caught but there was evidence of some strong and secret central force it was absolutely necessary to expose it strong pressure was brought upon me to look into the matter it has cost me two years watson but they have not been devoid of excitement when i say that i started my pilgrimage at chicago graduated in an irish secret society at buffalo gave serious trouble to the constabulary at skibbereen and so eventually caught the eye of a subordinate agent of von bork who recommended me as a likely man you will realize that the matter was complex since then i have been honored by his confidence which has not prevented most of his plans going subtly wrong and five of his best agents being in prison i watched them watson and i picked them as they ripened well sir i hope that you are none the worse the last remark was addressed to von bork himself who after much gasping and blinking had lain quietly listening to holmes's statement he broke out now into a furious stream of german invective his face convulsed with passion holmes continued his swift investigation of documents while his prisoner cursed and swore though unmusical german is the most expressive of all languages he observed when von bork had stopped from pure exhaustion hello hello he added as he looked hard at the corner of a tracing before putting it in the box this should put another bird in the cage i had no idea that the paymaster was such a rascal though i have long had an eye upon him mr von bork you have a great deal to answer for the prisoner had raised himself with some difficulty upon the sofa and was staring with a strange mixture of amazement and hatred at his captor i shall get level with you altamont he said speaking with slow deliberation if it takes me all my life i shall get level with you the old sweet song said holmes how often have i heard it in days gone by it was a favourite ditty of the late lamented professor moriarty colonel sebastian moran has also been known to warble it and yet i live and keep bees upon the south downs curse you you double traitor cried the german straining against his bonds and glaring murder from his furious eyes no no it is not so bad as that said holmes smiling as my speech surely shows you mr altamont of chicago had no existence in fact i used him and he is gone then who are you it is really immaterial who i am but since the matter seems to interest you mr von bork i may say that this is not the first acquaintance with members of your family i have done a good deal of business in germany in the past and my name is probably familiar to you i would wish to know it said the prussian grimly it was i who brought about the separation between irene adler and the late king of bohemia when your cousin heinrich was the imperial envoy it was i also who saved from murder by the nihilist clubman count von und zu grafenstein who was your mother's elder brother it was i von bork sat up in amazement 
there's only one man he cried exactly said holmes von bork groaned and sank back on the sofa and most of that information came through you he cried what is it worth what have i done it is my ruin for ever it is certainly a little untrustworthy said holmes it will require some checking and you have little time to check it your admiral may find the new guns rather larger than he expects and the cruisers perhaps a trifle faster von bork clutched at his own throat in despair there are a good many other points of detail which will no doubt come to light in good time but you have one quality which is very rare in a german mr von bork you are a sportsman and you will bear me no ill-will when you realize that you who have outwitted so many other people have at last been outwitted yourself after all you have done your best for your country and i have done my best for mine and what could be more natural besides he added not unkindly as he laid his hand upon the shoulder of the prostrate man it is better than to fall before some ignoble foe these papers are now ready watson if you will help me with our prisoner i think that we may get started for london at once it was no easy task to move von bork for he was a strong and a desperate man finally holding either arm the two friends walked him very slowly down the garden walk which he had trod with such proud confidence when he received the congratulations of the famous diplomatist only a few hours before after a short final struggle he was hoisted still bound hand and foot into the spare seat of the little car his precious valise was wedged in beside him i trust that you are as comfortable as circumstances permit said holmes when the final arrangements were made should i be guilty of a liberty if i lit a cigar and placed it between your lips but all amenities were wasted upon the angry german i suppose you realize mr sherlock holmes said he that if your government bears you out in this treatment it becomes an act of war what about your government and all this treatment said holmes tapping the valise you're a private individual you have no warrant for my arrest the whole proceeding is absolutely illegal and outrageous absolutely said holmes kidnapping a german subject and stealing his private papers well you realize your position you and your accomplice here if i were to shout for help as we pass through the village my dear sir if you did anything so foolish you would probably enlarge the two limited titles of our village inns by giving us the dangling prussian as a signpost the englishman is a patient creature but at present his temper is a little inflamed and it would be as well not to try him too far no mr von bork you will go with us in a quiet sensible fashion to scotland yard whence you can send for your friend baron von herling and see if even now you may not fill that place which he has reserved for you in the ambassadorial suite as to you watson you are joining us with your old service i understand so london won't be out of your way stand with me here upon the terrace for it may be the last quiet talk that we shall ever have the two friends chatted in intimate converse for a few minutes recalling once again the days of the past while their prisoner vainly wriggled to undo the bonds that held him as they turned to the car holmes pointed back to the moonlit sea and shook a thoughtful head there's an east wind coming watson i think not holmes it is very warm good old watson you are the one fixed point in a changing age there's an east wind coming all the same such a wind as never blew on england yet it will be cold and bitter watson and a good many of us may wither before its blast but it's god's own wind none the less and a cleaner better stronger land will lie in the sunshine when the storm has cleared start her up watson for it's time we were on our way i have a cheque for five hundred pounds which should be cashed early for the drawer is quite capable of stopping it if he can end of section twelve end of his last bow by sir arthur conan doyle recorded by librivox volunteers
2014.